Before we begin, I would like to go over a few considerations for our discussion, as well as some housekeeping notes. Um, afterwards, I'll turn things over to Dr. Um, Teresa Mullen from the FDA to offer some opening remarks. So the goal for discussion today is to gather stakeholder input on challenges and approaches to enhancing the existing data sharing infrastructure and data um, sharing efforts uh, throughout the product development lifecycle to support clinically meaningful therapeutic advances for patients impacted by rare diseases. This discussion is a timely one. Uh, we, are seeing, um, uh, we are seeing an unprecedented amount of collaboration across the public and private sphere to support pre-competitive data sharing in our national and global response to COVID-19. We and our FDA colleagues um, hope to provide a forum for open discussion about how lessons learned from ongoing and newly initiated data sharing efforts can inform enhancements to the existing data sharing infrastructure for rare disease and support increased adoption of shared tools for rare disease drug development. So first, a few reminders about our meeting format and uh, to help us organize discussion in the vir virtual setting. We're joined uh, by, the group, uh, by a group of uh, rare disease subject matter experts listed in the speaking, uh, with speaking roles on the agenda, and also several hundred rare diseases stakeholders who have registered for this public meeting. We're very glad that each one of you is able to join today. A bit later, we will be conducting a short Zoom poll to obtain more information about the composition of this group. Um, a reminder that the meeting materials are available on the Duke Margolis event website. We will have um, tw Twitter information on the website. Participants should feel free to tweet about the meeting using the hashtag um, rare, uh, rare data share. And to our workshop speakers, uh, Mira Gill will advance the slide deck on our end. So just please give a verbal prompt that you would like the next slide. If you would like to speak during an open session, um, during the open discussion portion of the meeting, either during your session or in others, please switch your camera on and raise your virtual hand by clicking on participants, then clicking raise hand. Um, please keep yourself muted when you're not speaking. And this is, those are the directions for the roundtable participants. To our registered stakeholders, if you would like to ask a question or make a comment during the open discussion portion of the meeting, please type it into the Zoom chat box or email rd.datasharing at duke.edu. Again, rd.datasharing at duke.edu. For everyone, if you have a question during the presentation, please type it into the Zoom chat box to avoid interruptions. So we have a packed agenda today and to ensure that we wrap up on time, it would be great, uh, it would be a great help if each one of the presenters could keep their remarks to 15 minutes and if the reactants could provide approximately five minutes of remarks before the panel discussions. And we have allotted a lot of time for discussions as well in sessions um, two and beyond. Kelly Wall from Duke Margolis will be helping us keep track of time and will send your timing prompts via Zoom chat um, throughout the day. Please direct um, Zoom message, uh, please send a direct Zoom message to Rashid Willis or email rwillis at newmediamill.com with technical issues. Additionally, we will be um, recording this meeting and it will be um, available at the Duke Margolis um, event website and YouTube channel after the conclusion of this event. Finally, um, the Duke Margolis Center is convening today's uh, meeting in cooperation with the FDA. This is not a federal advisory committee meeting. While we're keenly interested in your input on this topic, we won't be following advisory committee procedures or taking a vote at the end of this meeting. Uh, the meeting will be a success if there is an exchange of lots of ideas and open discussion. So we are thrilled that you are able to join us today and we anticipate an interesting and productive discussion. So uh, next slide, please. So now um, it would be great if you could participate in the poll. So um, with the good sense of the group composition, uh, we then uh, will be able to proceed. So if you could please respond to the poll that you see on the screen. So we'll give you just a short moment to finish 
addressing the poll, and then we'll share with you the results shortly. Can we see the results? Great, well, thank you. Um, I hope you can see it. So the, we have the largest representation actually from sponsors and pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we have uh, quite a few participants from the FDA and I expect also from uh, NIH. Um, a lot of uh, representation from academic and research institutions and uh, data vendors. Uh, we have patient and, uh, and patient representatives as well. All right, thank you so much. Um, so with that, let me move to the next slide. So let me walk you through the meeting agenda. So session one, here's when we're go where we're going to hear about the utility of a robust rare disease data sharing infrastructure for the production of shared data resources and drug development tools. We will also hear about ongoing efforts to support clinical trial readiness of preclinical rare disease data as well as efforts to enhance the availability of a shared data and tools um, to support innovative trial design and efficient trial conduct. This short session um, will be only um, half hour and we will basically lay the stage for the remaining sessions. We're not actually going to have a discussion in that session. And then immediately we will go into session two, which will discuss discrete and specific benefits and potential risks associated with the use of um, shared data in preclinical and clinical research for key stakeholders. Uh, we will also discuss the nature of early collaboration between researchers and trialists to ensure data collection, that data collection is fit for, uh, fit for purpose. In session three, we will discuss operational considerations for ensuring quality in shared data resources via quality assurances in the design of preclinical and clinical data collection schemes, as well as quality management, standardization, curation, maintenance, and security practices. And then we'll discuss the value of standards for data collection to enable data interoperability and anonymization. Sorry. Um, okay, so uh, this will then uh, be wrap up uh, our day one. Tomorrow, we're going to pick up and we will talk about in session four, um, we will hear about several use cases with presentations and remarks covering the structure and characteristics of several rare disease data sharing platforms. And we will talk about specific tools and outputs generated by shared data platforms that help build efficiencies in the conduct of clinical trials. We will discuss cross-cutting challenges in platform management. And finally, we will hear the perspective of data consumers and contributors about the process associated with collecting data. In session five, we will discuss how research consortia are uniquely positioned to support preclinical research in rare diseases. We will also discuss clinical trial networks and common and shared research tools. Uh, and how they can streamline and make clinical data collection for rare diseases more efficient. We will also discuss considerations and challenges associated with facilitating uh, research participate, uh, participant engagement and enrollment and data sharing throughout a central coordinating center to support the evaluation of drug safety and efficacy and regulatory submission. And finally, in session six, we, we will um, have uh, coming together thinking about next steps with the goals of encouraging the clinical trial readiness of preclinical pre data, the use of shared data in clinical trials, and the sharing and reuse of clinical trial data for secondary purposes. We will again use this session to discuss opportunities for stakeholders to better collaborate on incentives, principles for the design and implementation of shared data collection, and the management and governance of shared data. With that, I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Teresa Mullen, um, Associate Director for Strategic Initiatives in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the FDA, and she will um, offer some op opening remarks. Teresa. Thank you, Marta. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, we're very glad that you were able to join us for this uh, two-day workshop. And, uh, and Marta's already uh, told you my title. There it is on the slide, so I don't have to give you that again. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about what uh, sort of inspired us to have this initiative. So we're having this workshop. It's really part of our FDA initiative um, that we call Rare Disease Cures Accelerator. And uh, this is an effort that was enabled by funding that uh, was provided by Congress to Center for Drugs starting in 2019. And it was to support our, us in doing work to uh, really enhance and further support rare disease drug development and innovation. 
And so with that, we took this as an opportunity for to try to address some of the common challenges to sponsors and investigators and patients in rare disease drug development. And this is including, but not limited to, the fact that there are a limited number of patients available uh, to participate in studies or to use to gather information about the natural history of the disease. Limited experience on the part of, of some developers and clinical investigators and academic researchers who are passionately interested in finding cures, but may not have a lot of experience with drug development. Um, limited resources that may be available to patients or to others to try to pursue development of drugs for rare diseases, and limited data because of all these other things. And so this can lead to a limited or poor quality of evidence that would be available to support regulatory decision making and to try to uh, support the approval of drugs to treat rare diseases. And so in these circumstances, data sharing is even more critical to the success of development programs and to get drugs available to people who have rare diseases. We wanted to uh, give drug developers and make sure drug developers in the rare disease space know uh, how important FDA considers it to be uh, that uh, there be a good opportunities for data sharing. And we consider this to be important, for example, uh, to inform disease characterization clinical trial design, and for many other purposes. And, uh, and so uh, that inspired us to have this meeting and to plan this meeting uh, for today and tomorrow. And, and so for the next two days, we're going to be addressing a series of very important topics related to data sharing and taking advantage of shared platforms that are available and can be made available and to conduct um, higher quality and, and perhaps more successful uh, development programs for rare disease. And so as Marta, she's just gone through this very well, so I, I don't want to belabor it, but today we're going to have sessions on uh, the benefit of, of shared data for disease characterization and drug development, uh, how to leverage uh, shared data sources in, in uh, drug development, and ensuring quality in those shared data sources and, and data interoperability and protection and management, all the practical considerations to really have access, merge data to be able to analyze it readily, and gain insights from it. And then tomorrow, as Marta was saying, we're going to be able to uh, talk more about other critical, critically important areas like platform analytics tools that are available that might be used to support drug development in the rare disease area and collaborative research networks uh, to support rare disease and, uh, and, and further that work. And finally, where, what, what are next steps and where can we go from here? So we're very excited to have this uh, meeting today. We have a wonderful, um, set of speakers that are going to come who have uh, world, the world's exper expertise in terms of how to do this and, and to share that with you and share what they uh, hope will happen with you and what could happen uh, if, with shared uh, data and resources. And so uh, with that and, and the panel sessions that we have, we hope that you gain a lot of, um, of good information and insight and, and ideas for ways to move forward and further even enhance programs and your own approaches in developing drugs or trying to ensure that work is done to support development of drugs for rare diseases. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our session one uh, panel speakers. Thank you so much, Teresa. So let me um, now introduce the speakers in session one. Um, so we have Dr. Tina Erk, who is the product, uh, program director for the Rare Diseases Clinical Research Network in the National Center for Translational Science at the NIH. And also Dr. Katie Donahue, who is the acting director of the Division of Rare Diseases and Medical Genetics in the Office of Rare Diseases, Pediatrics, Urologic, and Reproductive Medicine at the FDA. So Drs. Erb and, uh, and Donahue will speak broadly about some of the scientific and operational barriers impending drug development for rare diseases, as well as how existing data sharing infrastructure and approaches can be enhanced and leveraged uh, to help address those challenges. So Tina, please go ahead. Thank you very much. So, hi, my name is Tina Irv. I'm here from, oops. And Tina, we would encourage you to go on, yes, on video. Yeah, you know what? It was telling me you guys blocked me, and I thought, oh, maybe oh. I should have done my hair. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, my name's Tina Irv, and I'm here from the National Center for Advancing Translational Science, better known as the NCATS. 
and the National Institutes of Health. And I work in the Office of Rare Disease Research. So next slide. Today, I'm going to start off with some basics about rare disease. So if you think about it, more people have rare diseases than have HIV or Alzheimer's disease or all cancers combined. In fact, more people have rare diseases than have all those conditions combined. Approximately 30 million people in the United States have a rare disease, and that's one in 10 people. And this is slightly less than have diabetes. So there are 7,000 rare diseases with about 230 diseases identified each year. For these disorders, there are only 5% with an approved treatment. And currently we see about three to five new treatments approved each year. And if you look at the little graph there and you look at the slope of the line, you will see that um, we're comparing the rate of new conditions added, and that's the steep slope, to the rate of treatments developed. And that's pretty flat slope. If we keep going at this rate that we're currently moving at, it's going to take a really long time to have treatments for all these conditions. And that is just unacceptable. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna look at the landscape of rare disease drug development. It is different from the landscape of drug development for common disorders. We can look at, let's look at what we have here. We have a lot of people working on their own islands and not necessarily speaking their own language. You have people making the same journey, but often they have to create their own paths to get there because there's not a lot of clearly marked roads on how to travel this route of rare disease drug development. And there are scary dragons. <laughs> so when you're working in academia as a researcher or a clinician, drifting into the unfamiliar territory of drug development and regulatory agencies can be absolutely terrifying. Next slide, please. People are working in silos, and this is pretty much the view you get in the silo, the inside of a silo and what it's pointing at. But what we need to do next is really look at the bigger picture. And we need to look at the whole landscape from the beginning. So you discover a new rare disease, that day you should start thinking about okay, what do we need to get into place to treat this child or this adult? You know, what, what do we need to do? What is the landscape looking at? So not just, you need to look at not just where you're at, but where you're going to go and who you need to work with to get to where you're going. So at the end of the day, we're all wanting the same thing. We want treatments for rare diseases. Next slide. So what's the holdup? So current estimates are that it can take 10 to 15 years to get a drug to market. It can cost $2.6 billion to develop a drug from the initial discovery to completion. And there's less than 12% approval rate for drugs entering the development stage. So the current approach is not sustainable. We aren't getting what we needed and it's just not working. Next slide. What do we need to do? We need to work faster. We need to work cheaper. We need to work with higher quality studies and data. And that is the only way we're going to become sustainable. Next slide. So what are some of the things that we can do? What we need to do are develop some new strategies. Well, what are some strategies that can be developed to work faster? You can establish networks. So you can have clinical research networks established. So you have the clinicians who know the patients who can run clinical trials for you already working together. You can bring the patient advocacy groups. And I mean all the different patient advocacy groups, not your favorite patient advocacy group, but all of them who work in that space or are impacted by what you're doing. Bring them all together early. You know, before you're even thinking of a clinical trial, these people should all be working and talking. The other is to establish natural history studies and to develop tools, outcome measures, biomarkers, common data elements. You should be thinking of this, again, in very early days before you even get to a clinical trial. Next slide, please. We also need to find ways to work cheaper 
or more economically. Um, you can use economies of scale, use a shared work environment. You know, do you need to have all 7,000 rare diseases have their own instance of cloud or buy their own tools that, that they use for data analysis? And you need innovative models for trials, for basket trials, umbrella trials. You could do more in less time. Next slide. The other important thing is high quality of data, fair using the FAIR principles and good data practices. And when I say this, I mean this from day one, when you first start collecting any type of information you're collecting, you want to, to, to impose quality onto it. Um, and also the research that you're doing, you need scientific river, rigor. It's yes, it's a natural history study, but yes, you need to be rigorous in what you're doing. Science needs to be reproducible and you need to be transparent in your actions so people can learn from not only when you do well, but when you fail. Next slide. By having, by working faster, cheaper, and having higher quality, that's really the only way that we can sustainably continue to develop treatments for rare diseases. Next slide, please. So what, what is our biggest enemy? And, and it's, you know, we're taking a lot of risks. We're jumping into trials when we might not be ready. So what do we need to do to, to get rid of this risk? Next slide. We need to be prepared. And this is my little buddy who is prepared for anything right now. Next slide, please. And so when we talk about clinical trial readiness, it's really that preparedness. It's that preparedness that, that protects us from risk. It's before you go into any trial, you should know why, what, where, when, who, and how. Next slide. And that's what we're really trying to do with the program that I'm responsible for, the RDCRN, the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network. This is a program that began in 2002 and was established by um, the Rare Disease Act, which is Public Law 107-280. Um, it's been funded for the past 15 years, and over that time, they've looked at 31 different consortia, 238 different disorders, and there have been 40,000 participants active in this network over 15 years. Um, in 2019, we awarded 20 new consortia. Next slide. And our intent was to really rework the established network to make the consortia ready for clinical trials. And when I say that, what we're really trying to do is we wanted to build on the strengths. We wanted to take what was really working well for the last 15 years and, and, and build on that, but also bring in things with the changing times. You know, the data standards, the sharing data, good data practices, that you, know, you have patient advocacy groups involved, but they need to be involved in a meaningful way. Not just here, we've signed a letter of support, we'll look at things when you want it. They need to be involved soup to nuts. We need to make sure that there's going to be a next generation of researchers to, to continue with the rare disease. If you look at how long it takes to develop a rare disease research, that could be someone's entire career. You really want to have the, the backup team ready to move in. Um, you want to, we wanted to provide an environment of shared resources and a shared environment where people could work together and really have rigorous research studies, no matter how small the projects are. Next slide, please. So this is what the RDCRN looks like today. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail about exactly what we're providing and how we're doing it because Eileen King is gonna be talking tomorrow. She's the PI of our data coordinating center along with Maurizio Macaluso. And she'll, she'll get into more of the nitty gritty. And I'm just gonna describe an overview of the programs we have. So the RDCRN, like I said before, has existed for 15 years. Um, it's a partnership across the NIH of 10 different institutes and centers and offices. 
Right now, we fund 10 different consortia. Each consortia looks at three different diseases, and they're all clinical studies, so no animal studies. Each consortia has to have partnership with the patient advocacy groups, with the clinical scientists and research, and because it's a cooperative agreement, it has um, a serious amount of input from the NIH. And we also have the Data Coordinating Center, which provides many different services. And like I said, Eileen is gonna talk about that tomorrow. Next slide, please. So what we really built this time is we're sort of imagining it as, instead of all these different consortia working individual, individually, we're bringing into one space. And since everyone loves to talk about cloud computing, I put all of our people into little clouds. Next slide, please. Within this cloud environment, we will have tools, we do have tools and we're building tools and resources and data services for the entire network to use. They're establishing data standards and good data practices for all the different consortia to use. And remember, this is kind of unusual because these are all very, very different rare diseases. Um, we're also working on data sharing, how the data can be formatted and prepared so it's ready to share with the community. They have um, clinical study support. Like I said before, it's very challenging for academic researchers to cross over into uh, a clinical trial that's going to go to the FDA that needs to follow um, regulatory processes. So they've kind of got a coach or a helper helping them to cross that ocean with dragons. And we're also trying to reach out and have engagement and disseminate the information we're doing. Next slide, please. And that was a slide, <laughs> sorry about that. That's our engagement and dissemination to patient, whoop, nope, that's good, to the patient groups and such. Next slide. So one of the challenges we face is a little bit of pushback from the PIs. We get comments like, we've been doing this for 15 years, why change? You know, these are rare, these rare diseases don't have anything in common with my group other than being rare. Next slide. You know, this natural history, it's not going to the FDA. Why do I need to use standards? I don't want to share my data. What if somebody scoops me? So these are the concerns that people have because people have been doing what they're doing for a very long time. Next slide. So one of the important things that we find is we need to get people to sit down and find commonalities. Next slide. And what we ask them to do is take off their individual rare disease hat or their individual disorder hat and put on a rare disease hat and really think about what are they all trying to do? Because they'll realize eventually they're all trying to do the same thing with a different name. Next. They are all trying to do things faster, cheaper. They want to do it with higher quality and they want it to be sustainable. And so there's really a psychological component that we, we can't just write off that's important to consider when we're trying to implement all these changes. Next slide. So the things, the take home things that I really want people to, to bring home is people should always look at the big picture. Don't think, well, we just discovered the disease and now we need a mouse model. Think of all the different things that need to be done and keep, always keep that in mind. Think of ways to be nimble. Do your research faster. Think of ways to make things more economic, cheaper. Demand high quality from research and data at all stages. No, whether it's a clinical trial or not, you want quality and collaborate. And you, none of us can do this alone. Next slide. So I like to think of my snowflake analogy is that alone rare diseases are like snowflakes. They're very fragile, but if you work together, they can form things like glaciers that can actually move mountains. Next slide. So I just wanna say thank you um, to the program directors and project scientists I work with at the RDCRN from the NIH, the consortial, consortia principal investigators that work tirelessly on rare disease, the patient advocacy groups that inspire me daily, the DMCC who are enthusiastically embracing our vision of faster, cheaper, and higher quality, um, my colleagues in the Office of Rare Disease Research, especially Ann Pariser, and Mira Shaw, who is my partner in crime with all things rare disease network. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Tina. So if I could now pass the mic to, um, to Katie um, Donahue, please. Katie. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be here with you. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, so thank you for the introduction, Marta, and the opening remarks, um, Teresa. And, you know, it's always an honor to be on a panel with Tina, but she's a hard act to follow. So I will, I will do my best. Uh, next slide, please, for disclosures. I have no, no context to disclose. All opinions are my own. Um, you know, our objectives for this opening session were really sort of to set the stage. And I think that Tina sort of very nicely outlined some of the challenges that, that we all face. Um, and I want to focus a bit on the benefits. You know, why, why do this? Um, and so slide four, we can go and, and talk about how to begin with the end in mind. So Mira, if we can go to slide four, please. Um, next one. Um, so this, this story is probably more, more true than factual, but I find it useful nonetheless. And um, this is a picture of, of um, the Great Hall at New College Oxford. It was founded in 1379. And like the other colleges, um, it has this big dining hall that was built with these huge old growth oak beams across the top. And um, legend has it that about 100 years ago, the beams started to become infested with beetles. And the college council was dismayed. They didn't know what to do. They explored all kinds of options, um, and all of them were sort of expensive or infeasible, and, and nothing was going to work. And this is a cherished heart of the academic institution. But modern oak trees just didn't grow to sufficient height and strength to support a roof that big. And then upon further inquiry, they realized that when the college was founded, the original forester had planted a grove of oak um, with a plan that they would be grown and available to replace the beams once they became beetly, because that's a thing that happens to old growth oak beams apparently. And this plan was just sort of passed down quietly from one forester to another forester. And so, you know, the, the data sharing initiative that we're talking about today, it's a big undertaking. And I think whenever we set out to do something big, it pays to begin with the end in mind and think about, you know, what is it that we need to do here? What is it that we're really trying to do? Um, just to keep us focused and on our goal. And um, Tina touched on this a lot, but it comes down to cooperative research. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, slide five, um, this is a picture of the Lasker um, Research Award panel. And you can see uh, Sydney Farber is the third from the left on the first row. Um, and, and these guys accomplished something really extraordinary. We have a lot to learn from them. Um, starting in the 1950s, if we go to slide six, they came together and, and decided to work as a team. You know, they realized that pediatric cancers are rare cancers, that no one of them was going to have enough patients to figure out whether or not a treatment worked, to understand the biology. They, they understood very quickly and very intuitively that they needed to work together if they were going to make a difference for patients. And so right from the get-go, they started working together. And you see in 1950 that their vision for cooperative research um, has been incredibly effective at securing and sustaining research funding over time. So that's this blue line here. This is billions of, of dollars um, held constant in 2012 dollars. And you can see that, that over time they've been remarkably successful at initiating and sustaining funding for their research work. Um, you know, and you can see that the scientific community has made good on that investment. So the red line here is the publication. And you see that um, as we've invested more and more in, in this cooperative research model, it's been incredibly productive. Um, so these are some really high quality publications over time. Um, and then if we go to slide seven, you can see, well, what, what has this accomplished, right? It's nice that we have lots of paper. That's good for academics, but what does that do for patients? Well, it does new treatments. So uh, you can see here the breakdown. So some of these are biologics or targeted therapies by color, but you can see, you know, a very similar sort of curve in terms of approved pediatric cancer treatments that really tracks what we're seeing with research investment dollars and, um, and publications. And um, again, the real impact, though, if you look at slide eight, is, is what inspired me originally. So if we go to slide eight, you can see the number of lives saved. And um, you can see all of this is the same time horizon. So all of these graphs that I'm showing you sort of start in 1940, 1950, and come through to um, the 2000s. And you can see 
they started cooperating in 1950. And you can see that the lines are really pretty flat. And there's all these really smart scientists working really hard in their labs by themselves in the 1940s. So a lot of the, the founding fathers of this group were already doing um, really high quality, frankly, scientific work, but they weren't getting anywhere. It was in 1950 that they started cooperating. And what you see here is that even though there was only the initial research investment dollars and the initial round of publication, you start to see childhood cancer survival rates really shoot up in the 50s and 60s. So even though it was early days for the network and early days for publications, the benefits to patients were almost immediate and they were dramatic. Um, and so, you know, within 40 or 50 years, we've got survival rates going from around 10% on average for pediatric cancer patients all the way up to 80, 85, 90% for some of these cancers. And a lot of that benefit came from the early years of collaboration. And so, you know, I want that for every patient with a rare disease. You know, I want all of them to be able to see, you know, in our lifetimes, in their lifetimes, see the survival rates in their communities shoot up like that. Um, and this cooperative research model is the only thing I've ever seen that has accomplished that. Um, I think we're coming up hard on the limits of what one investigator can do by themselves. And um, I think the, the Children's Oncology Group has really sort of given us an example of how, um, how we can work together in order to, to do this better. So that's, I mean, that's really the vision. That's the end in mind is that, hey, maybe if we work together and plan carefully, we could have that kind of impact on patients with all rare diseases. Um, and, you know, I want to go back to slide six because I think sharing data is scary. It's scary for academics. I think those concerns are legitimate. Um, so slide six is the research funding and publication slide, that's it. Right, and so I just want to be reassuring that, that this model in some ways has been much more effective than what we've seen for individual investigators sort of trying to go it alone. So working together has been a very effective strategy for the pediatric oncologists. Um, they've got incredible publication records and they've built successful academic careers. So it's possible. Um, and if anything, it may actually be a little easier. So one of the things that um, has come to my attention in talking with them is that it's a little easier to sustain a lifelong research career and um, to bring in and train new researchers because you have this network supporting all of them. It's not just one person working on their own. They're not just one grant away from having to fire everybody in their lab. Um, they've got some sustained funding and a sustained network and a sort of sustained foundation. Um, and this is important for the science too, because I think we've, we've all had experiences, we've all known researchers who have a really promising hypothesis and they hit some big gap in funding and that line of research, you know, sort of withers, even though it was really promising. And so the advantage of working together is that you're less likely to face those gaps. Um, there's, a, there's a bit more of that kind of sustained funding and safety of, of hunting for new discoveries in groups, if you will. Um, so I think the concerns are very legitimate, um, but I think what we're seeing from the Pediatric Oncology Network is that this might actually be the better way. Um, and so moving on to slide nine, if we can. I'm sorry, Mira, I'm skipping you around on my slide deck. <laughs> Thanks. Um, here we go. So this is a little taste. You're going to talk more about this in detail in the next couple days as there are lots of different shared tools and data platforms out there. Um, but this is one that we are especially excited about. It's funded by the FDA in combination with um, uh, CPATH and NORD, and it's this Rare Disease Cures Accelerator data and analytics platform. And it's basically a piece of infrastructure to allow for data sharing. And this, this um, slide is a little busy, but I want you to see on the left hand side, it's kind of Goldbergian, but you, know, you can see here we've got clinical trial data, registry data, natural history data, genomics, imaging, um, you know, other preclinical data. The idea is that patient groups could contribute their registry data, um, academics could contribute their natural history data, and industry partners could contribute their placebo arm data. And then CPATH can be an honest broker. And they've, they've already done this in the, in the neurology space with a really high degree of success. They've really started to build a culture of data sharing, and I'm seeing that it's advancing therapies for patients. It's working. Um, and there's a lot of work to do, right? Like patients need to know that their data is going to be secure and protected and their privacy will be protected. Academic investigators need to know that their ability to publish is going to be sustained. You know, they're not going to get scooped by colleagues. Um, and, you know, it, it, industry needs to know that it's not going to put 
them at a competitive disadvantage. And so every one of these stakeholders has some very legitimate concerns. And I'm encouraged that CPAP has really started to find um, ways to build bridges around those obstacles and over those obstacles and bring everybody together and find some solutions. Um, so they've got a track record of doing that. And I just want to give you a little taste of what can come out of that. So if we go to slide 10, um, one of the things that CPAP has done is they've built a clinical trial simulator. Now I realize the font size on this slide is kind of small, but what you're seeing on the left-hand side are um, these blue sliders. And they, they let you adjust um, all of the key parameters for designing a trial. This is for Alzheimer's disease. But you can see here, okay, how long does the trial need to be is the top slider. How frequently do we need to have study visits? Um, you know, what are the sort of baseline, the key baseline characteristics, whether it's, you know, sex or baseline mental status exam or a genetic factor. You can put in all of those kind of potential enrichment factors and get a sense of how your trial might perform. Um, you know, obviously, and you can put in baseline endpoint measurements, too. Um, what about the effect size of the drug? Well, you can model that. And you can even look at sort of the level of precision with which you're going to measure the endpoint. So one of the things that I think we have to do a lot more of in rare diseases is really sweat the details on the endpoint measurement and make sure that we are minimizing every source of noise. Um, and so that's that bottom slider there. And what you can do is when you've pooled all this data, it allows someone planning a clinical trial to model different ways of doing the trial based on the underlying data and they get a much clearer picture, it's a much clearer roadmap of what it's going to take for them to demonstrate that a therapy is helping patients. Um, this is a very powerful tool. You know, I'm working with uh, investigators, academic and, and commercial, every day trying to design, you know, the first clinical trial in a space, or maybe if we're lucky, it's the second or third. And we don't have anything like this for most of the rare diseases where I work. The, the, all of this is largely unknown. Um, and that is very concerning to me. You know, we don't, we don't want to have the first generation trial fail to detect a treatment that's actually helping patients. Like, we don't want to make that kind of mistake. Um, but most of our chance for avoiding that is right here. It's in having the answers to some of those questions as we're planning the trial. If we don't have a tool like this, if we don't have any data to inform those choices, it's like flying blind. Um, you know, we're, we're much more likely to get where we want to go and where we need to go for patients um, if we have information like this. And so the point of the data sharing is really to support these kinds of simulators so that we can make sure that we're designing the best possible trial for a, a treatment, a trial that has the best chance of success, um, you know, showing us that, hey, this treatment is really helping patients. So, so that's the idea. It's supposed to be just sort of a little taste of what's to come over the next couple of days. Um, but I think Tina really mapped out a lot of the challenges. Um, you know, I sort of teed up some of the opportunities here, but also um, you know, some of the challenges and considerations in doing the data sharing, you know, in terms of protecting patient data, um, making sure that academics have the right to publish and the opportunity to publish, and that um, industry can protect its commercial interests. And so we have to work together to get that right. And I think the CPAP model is a pretty good one. There are other ones, too. Um, uh, but we're starting to make some progress in that space. So with that, I will say thank you um, and turn it back to Teresa for the rest of our session. Uh, thank you, Katie. So um, actually, we are um, slightly ahead and now our next session was going to start at 1.50. So I will actually give everybody a five minute break and we will resume at 1.50. So go ahead and stretch and answer one or two emails, but not many more. And we'll see you in five minutes. And then we will continue. I know there were questions for you, Katie, in there, but we're hoping that you're staying through the next session and then we can have it as part of the broader discussion in session two. Okay. Uh, from uh, Tina and 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 Katie. So let me now introduce uh, to you a session to presenters and panelists. So we will um, first have Carla Childers, who is the Senior Director of Strategic Projects at Johnson & Johnson. And she will provide a short presentation in this section um, 
uh, laying out this, uh, setting up the discussion for us. Uh, then we were going to have um, several um, people um, who are going to serve on a panel, so to speak. Michelle Campbell, who is the Senior Clinical Analyst for Stakeholder Engagement and Clinical Outcomes at the FDA. Um, Vanessa Bollinger, uh, who is the Director of Research um, at the National Organization of Rare Diseases, or NORD. Uh, Jim Wilson, who is the director of the Gene Therapy Program and Orphan Disease Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Petrula Sboku, um, who is the acting deputy division director of the Division of Rare Diseases and Medical Genetics in the Office of Rare Diseases, Pediatrics, Urologic, and Reproductive Medicine at FDA. And uh, Petra Kaufman, who is the vice president, uh, R&D, Translational Medicine at Avexis, uh, which is part of Novartis. So again, as noted before, the participants in this uh, discussion in this session are going to take a deeper dive into some of the themes that Tina and Katie uh, have laid out, in particular around the discrete benefits and potential risks associated with the use of shared data. We will talk also about the critical nature of early collaboration between researchers and sponsors and trialists um, to ensure quality in the design of data collection schemes and data collection that is fit for purpose. And as a reminder, we'll use the next session in part, the session three, to discuss operational considerations. So uh, we will basically continue diving in uh, deep, more deeply um, into some of the themes that uh, Tina and, and Katie um, have laid out. So um, if I um, could turn it over to Carla. Go ahead, Carla. Great, thanks so much, Marta. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. And if you could advance to the next slide. Um, so as mentioned, I work at Johnson & Johnson in the Office of the Chief Medical Officer, where I have a largely ethics and policy type role. I, I coordinate our internal bioethics committee, but I've also been responsible for our clinical trial data sharing uh, program with the Yale Open Data Access Project. And so was asked to share our experience as an example and offer it as a springboard um, to further the discussion we'll have in this session. So I'll place my role in a little bit of context in the office of the chief medical officer, share a little bit what me, we mean by responsible data sharing and how that's evolved a little bit give some background into the Yoda project and current um, assessment and impact and share some learnings. So if you go to the next slide, this just provides a, a snapshot of the Office of the Chief Medical Officer at J&J &J, where I sit as a functionally independent global group. And you'll see in that sort of upper right hand pink corner, the bioethics and scientific policy is largely what my remit and the service that we offer to the business. So a lot of what we do is set, helping set expectations on principles and policies for the rest of the organization. Um, so the next slide, and you can click one more time after that, is just to level set. So when I say data sharing and, and just being clear, and it sounds like we're probably all aligned and maybe this slide was unnecessary, but there are different ways that we extend the research of clinical trials or, or share what's going on. And so the traditional route of registration results disclosure that you think of udract.ct.gov, the publication and the literature of what results mean and how we share the results. And then really how we view data sharing is what more might be learned from others than just the initial um, analysis of those data for which they might have been uh, collected. And so next slide talks about what we believe is uh, the value of responsible data sharing. And I'll, I'll emphasize responsible because early on we talked about um, with clinical trials just that we had an obligation to not just sort of throw the data over the wall and hope for the best, but really think critically about the different stakeholders, the different um, risks, the different opportunities that might be there for data sharing. And you can just see here five sort of key principles when we think about responsible data sharing, meaning that it, it honors the people who volunteered their time, um, sharing their data for good. We have a high focus on privacy and confidentiality and respecting those individuals in a practical way that still allows their data to be utilized. We want to focus on research that advances science by better understanding diseases, generating new insights that expand knowledge, and really enabling better care. So we see a really high value proposition for extending this life of these clinical trial data um, that, that have been collected for a particular purpose, but could be envisioned for others. If you go to the next slide, 
I, this was just a piece by Michelle Mello and colleagues a, a couple of years ago that I like to highlight, and I think this will go to some of the points you might hear, is that individuals who participate in clinical trials um, actually support the belief that benefits outweigh the potential risks. And I think this will probably be resonant with this group. Um, and I just thought this was a really interesting piece of work they did where they surveyed, I think it was over 700 uh, clinical trial participants. Um, you'll see a little bit of a downtick on whether it was sharing data with academia or for-profit companies, and you'll see some dimensions that were concerns for folks. But in general, the vast majority of clinical trial participants do perceive that benefits outweigh the risks. And I think this will be an, an important conversation piece uh, in a little bit. And then the next slide is just sort of reminding us a little bit of history. And, and this, again, maybe not as, as important for this group, but for some people that we talked to about this, was just a progression of, of really the clamoring in the public and, and researchers and different groups to make data more available, to have increased transparency. And so we've seen over time and over years this momentum to really be more expansive with concepts around data sharing to get us to where we are now. And this was mostly, I think, if you see those references are back from 2010 and 12. And on the next slide, you, you, I think you really see what happened and you can click at least two and you can stop there. Thank you so much, Mira. Um, you can see that uh, right around that time in 2013, when the responsible prin uh, principles for responsible clinical trial data sharing were issued in 2013, you saw a lot of activity in the industry really stepping up and embracing these principles and putting in place processes and systems to share clinical trial data to make it easier. You've seen a lot of different organizations come along on the bottom and issue different guidelines and perspectives. And, and you've seen um, a lot of organizations on the right. You'll see the Yoda Project there, other companies and other types of platforms crop up for sharing clinical trial data. So I think you've seen a lot of activity, at least I have as somebody who's been very engaged in for this for the last several years, um, that these steps have been taken. Uh, and, and around that time on the next slide, you'll see that, um, and I, I include this just as a reference is, um, for those of you who might not be aware of it, um, at about the same time in early 2015, the Institute of Medicine uh, had a study committee that it really examined the benefits and the risks and the potential ways of thinking about this. And again, established some guidelines. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of those guidelines there at the bottom and how they fit into our Yoda project process. But just really important things like laying out use agreements that talk about how you're going to use the data and trying to involve um, the public in the review of the policies and having independent panels review things. And so I just post this here as, as an important cornerstone and reference that really put in place and memorialized a lot of the thinking of the time back in 2015. And on the next slide, I think you'll see that there has been a rise in clinical trial data sharing and you'll see you've seen greater compliance and more analysis and I think really helpful analysis and critiques of the extent to which um, both industry sponsors and then other academic sponsors have complied with rules around disclosure requirements. And I think you've also seen, and, and I'll be excited to share with you metrics that we've seen year over year of an increase in the number of publications and activity just in the clinical trial data sharing um, for companies. And, and before I really move into a, a information on the Yoda project, the next slide, um, I think this is an interesting place that we're also seeing a lot of um, coalescence of in interest and, and again, probably not surprising to this group looking at the different data sources. And, and I loved, um, I think it was Katie's slide, the, the, Gold, the Goldberg-like process slide that had all the different inputs of data. And I think you are seeing a lot of different data sources. So it's great to see those types of projects that are contemplating how we can bring together different types of data into different platforms and really build on what we've learned and, and kind of um, take advantage of those things we've thought about as we continue on the journey of expanding our understanding of how to share data. So that was just a little bit of a preamble. So if you click two more times, um, you'll see that we go to uh, some of the principles that Johnson & Johnson had in mind, um, very similar to what we've talked about the responsible principles for sharing data, but again, a focus on protecting the privacy of clinical trial participants. Um, and, and I think this is an, probably an important consideration, especially when you're talking about small numbers and rare disease and thinking about that and, and balancing those benefits and risks and really engaging the individuals and in understanding what level of risk might be acceptable to them and it could be different. 
um, and, and upholding the spirit of informed consent and making sure that people do understand that the potential trade-offs of sharing data and are really aware of that and have an understanding. We personally at J&J &J have found that the independent review process we have with the Yoda project has been critically important um, from the scientific aspect. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit, I think, I'll put a pin in number four, the legal agreements have also often been some of the most difficult parts of sharing data outside of our established process through the Yoda project. So I'll, I'll just note that for our future panel discussion coming up shortly. Um, and I think number five is really important for any kind of data sharing collaboration activity that you really want to make sure that the results from that are made public. And I think that was an important acknowledgement that, that Katie also made about um, making sure that researchers understand they'll still be able to publish. There's still an opportunity for that. So if you go to the next slide, um, this is just briefly, um, I mean, we we found a lot of value in leveraging the Yoda project because they had experience with data sharing, had written about it, were, were excellent thinkers in this space, Harlan Krumholtz, Joe Ross up at Yale, and really had a shared view of what we thought were the benefits of responsible data sharing. So I'd encourage you as you think about models to find the partners that have those similar mindsets and, and, and are having sort of an agreed upon vision of that. And for J&J &J on the next slide, I'll, I'll briefly just mention that we have a, a, over the course of two to three years defining scope so that we're now sharing clinical trial data across all three sectors for pharmaceuticals, med devices, and regulated consumer products. Um, and the next slide is the Yoda project process. Um, I'll, it's a little bit of an eye chart, but I'll just say that some of the important highlights are that the process is managed independently by the Yoda project. So researchers submit their requests and research proposals to the Yoda project. We agreed on an original scope of trials that would be included so that there's a list. They then have all the decisions after that. So they're the ones who review the proposals for scientific merit. They're the ones who make all the decisions and they are the ones who are the interface between us and the researchers so that the researchers really have confidence in the credibility and the independence of the process. We don't have veto rights. We don't get to say anything about the research that's agreed upon with the Yoda project in advance, the principals will use um, and then they manage the process. Um, and then the data are procured in a secure environment. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to the next slide, um, if you can click twice, because I'm just kind of watching the clock. I want to make sure I don't go too much over my allotted 15 minutes. I think this is an important slide, though. So just in the last six years, we've seen 37 publications come from data shared through the Yoda project. And this is really exciting. These are 37 publications from reuse of data that didn't require additional clinical trials to be conducted. Um, absolutely, they required additional effort by researchers, but these were things that you didn't have to put in place another clinical trial. You spared it, it, really capitalizing on the benefit from those data. So this is really exciting to us. Um, shared over 313 clinical trials. So I just, I put this up there as an inspiration um, to what is possible when you do make data available. And I'm conscious of time, so maybe click forward for me two times, and then maybe one more. And so I'll just mention um, some highlights on this slide. Uh, as the Yoda project put in place and worked with us to establish our process. These were just some things that, that we took away that, you know, in the development of the policies and procedures, they posted them public for public comment um, before they finalized them, which we thought was an important step for transparency to get alignment from key stakeholders. They um, had an independent steering committee to which they could send complex questions that they either wanted some additional independence from or wanted um, a, a pathway to have some subject matter expertise. Um, again, I can't emphasize enough thinking in advance about how to navigate the legal issues of data transfer agreements, data use agreements, and trying to find harmonized um, approaches to that was an important lesson we learned. Um, and this is a publication that we issued, uh, published in Nature uh, a few years ago. Um, and the lessons learned slide, I'll maybe the next one spend just a minute as I wrap up my part of the time sharing and you can see in magenta the highlights that we had really a commitment to transparency a full commitment to making everything public about the process about the deliberations about the outcomes that has been very important for us in the yoda project to, for folks to have confidence in that 
um, the required data use agreement that, that sets the expectations for both the researchers and the entities um, providing data to the uh, platform. Um, the proposal submission and public posting of the protocol, transparency about the research being done, um, the required public dissemination of findings, again, a commitment all throughout the way. And we felt that these were important hallmarks to making sure that our commitments to the patients and the individuals in the clinical trials were upheld by making this generalizable knowledge available for the public and available for appropriate use and that those findings um, were provided to the public as well. Um, I think some opportunities we still have, we're still exploring different types of data sets, how we can overcome some of the obstacles around observational data, non-interventional clinical trials and licensing around ownership of data sets and repositories. We still have not um, cracked the nut on sort of pre-competitive data sharing in the preclinical space. And I, I think we'll have some colleagues on the panel talking about that. And there is still a reasonable investment in the infrastructure. And again, I think what Katie showed in that, that process flow, there, there's a lot of resource and effort put into the standardization, harmonization um, to try to make the data sets um, usable. Right now in this model, the, the burden falls primarily on investigators to really do that and work through that. Um, so those are some opportunities uh, we've seen as well. So with that, I think I'll, I'll maybe pause my portion, and this is just to give you a flavor. And I think if you can take away and, and know that there's an opportunity for success and it is possible, and we can talk more about some of what we learned and how it relates to what you guys want to cover. So thank you so much, Marta, for the opportunity to share that. And I'll, I'll uh, go over to the panel now. Great. Well, thank you so much, Carla. And we definitely want to engage you in the discussion um, after we um, have the reactants um, provide comments. Um, so uh, before we're not ready yet to jump into the discussion, we're going to first turn it for some commentary from uh, a few folks. So first, if I could turn it to Michelle Campbell from the FDA. Well, thank you, Marta. Um, as Marta said, my name is Michelle Campbell and I lead stakeholder engagement and clinical outcomes for the Office of Neuroscience. I'd like to thank those presenters and panelists here today, as well as the other audience members who've joined us in this online meeting. I would also like to thank Carla for her presentation, which I thought was extremely informative, and particularly for her sharing of the experience of engaging in data sharing through the Yoda project. The opportunity to share data is critical in accelerating drug development for the rare diseases. And while over half of all new molecular entities approvals recently have been in our rare diseases, including four, the three new molecular entities and one new indication in the last few weeks out of the Office of Neuroscience, there are still over 7,000 diseases and most without an improved treatment. Carla's presentation provided a great overview of the benefits of data sharing, including generating new insights that expand knowledge to develop new treatments. We encourage data sharing from all stakeholders. By bringing together various data sets clinical trial data, observational studies, and patient registries, just to name a few, from all stakeholders into a pre-competitive space arena will allow for an optimized opportunity to bring together multiple data sources into one location. Over the next two days, you will hear about various current data sharing initiatives. Data sharing is here and it is currently happening. And thanks to the early adopters of data sharing, we have example of success stories. Carla has presented one example and others will be discussed um, over the rest of today and tomorrow. From the lessons learned, we can better inform patients about the opportunity to share data, learn how to better build platforms, and to collectively develop data standards. I know the rest of my colleagues who will be uh, giving some brief remarks based on, our pre on the presentation we just saw um, will also continue to enlighten us on their thoughts from their stakeholder perspective. Um, but I encourage uh, all of us who are participating today to consider uh, the opportunity to share data and how it can truly help us accelerate treatment options in the rare disease space. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, and just before I turn to Vanessa, um, just a reminder, if you have questions uh, to tee up for our discussion session, which is coming up in about 15 or 20 minutes, 
Uh, if you could please either type them into chat or you can send an email to rd.data at duke.edu. So rd as in rare disease, rd.data at duke.edu. Or you can type them into chat and then we'll make sure that um, we can incorporate uh, your comments into the discussion. And so I will turn this to Vanessa um, at this point. Just a, another a little logistical um, issue, and not, it's not an issue. When we go to the discussion, we will ask all the panelists to come back on video, but at this point, we're only going to do one speaker at a time. Um, so um, Vanessa, please go ahead. And I just saw Vanessa, but I don't see her anymore. And I'm wondering whether accidentally she might have disconnected. Vanessa, are you on? Yes, she is. Okay, Vanessa, um, are you? So how about uh, Vanessa, I think might be dialing in. I don't know if we can, yes. So Jim, would you be able to provide your comments first and then we will switch to Vanessa um, shortly? Sure, I'd be happy to. Let me see if you can see me. I'm on. Yes, we can see you. Great. Yeah, so um, this is Jim Wilson coming from the University of Pennsylvania where I run uh, the gene therapy program and also direct the Orphan Disease Center. So I've lived for three decades at the intersection of gene therapy and rare diseases and there are some themes that have emerged that are very relevant to the uh, topic of our discussion today. Um, I'm specifically going to comment on the approach uh, for treating rare diseases through uh, in vivo gene therapy, where you have a, a delivery vehicle called a vector that you could directly administer to a patient to target certain cell types uh, to engineer those cells to uh, provide a therapeutic effect. And so the there's a, a term used in drug development called platforms, but for gene therapy, this is really the consummate platform because uh, these delivery vehicles are either identical across diseases or very similar, and all that is different is the payload, uh, so that uh, many issues regarding their manufacturing, uh, their uh, performance in preclinical models, and their safety and efficacy are common across multiple diseases and multiple sponsors because the vehicle is identical or very similar. This provides us with an opportunity to leverage experiences across sponsors in very important ways. So I just wanna comment on, 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 on two areas. One has to do with preclinical studies, such as uh, something called biodistribution, when you deliver a vector a certain way, where does it go and where does it deposit? That's a property of the delivery vehicle, not the payload. So we have argued uh, for uh, open sharing of preclinical studies across sponsors to potentially obviate the need for sponsors to uh, needlessly reproduce uh, uh, these biodistribution studies and that one can uh, potentially uh, re refer to one another's uh, study. I, I've, I've heard that's difficult to do uh, from a regulatory standpoint and one challenge is many of these important toxicology studies or preclinical studies, they're hard to get published because they're not hypothesis driven. I actually created a journal called the Human Gene Therapy Clinical Development just for this. So there was a venue for publishing this work. And, and health authorities, FDA has been very supportive of this approach, but we as sponsors have to be able to share and that sharing doesn't occur as much as it should. And then, most importantly, and we can talk about this more in the discussion, has to do with safety. Um, a lot of uh, uh, the safety issues that have emerged in gene therapy relate to the interaction of the host with the actual delivery vehicle. And what we're seeing now as the field of gene therapy is advancing is we're seeing safety issues emerging. And most recently, when you inject very high doses of vector into the blood, um, that there have been described in a number of uh, studies, very severe toxicity and most recently deaths in two young children um, that have uh, received high doses of this vector. Uh, and, and it really, the onus is on us uh, as a community to try to come together uh, to share the data and to share our thinking 
because one application and, and uh, for a particular sponsor could be very relevant to one another's application. Uh, and, uh, and there are other safety issues that are emerging as well. So when it comes to safety of these platforms, um, we believe, and, and many, uh, many do as well, it's important for us to try to share this information. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Jim. So I'm wondering, is, um, is Vanessa available now to, to speak, make her comments? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, and we can see you as well. Great, oh, go ahead. Great. Oh, great. Sorry about that. I had a bit of a technical issue. <laughs> so thank you, Martha, and thank you, Jim, for stepping in um, out of order. <laughs> And Carla, um, also thank you and Michelle for the perfect setup and meeting. So as mentioned, I'm Vanessa Boulanger and I direct the research and scientific work for the National Organization for Rare Disorders, or NORD. And as uh, Teresa and Michelle and our session one speakers have highlighted, research and drug development for rare diseases can be challenging across stakeholders for a number of reasons. And so I thought it might be a good place to start with just a few additional points for consideration that involve the engagement of patients and the responsibilities of study sponsors. So consideration for participant burden, particularly for rare disease research, where people are balancing just so, so much is critically important in the design of studies and trials, what we're asking of people in order to participate, in study sponsored decision making around developing a new study rather than partnering with efforts that may already exist. We have many reasons to judiciously and thoughtfully leverage resources to reduce burden on patients. And one approach to this is sharing and bringing together data and information that we have available now in order to expand our understanding of disease characterization while new data and tools are also being generated. Each person and each experience is so critically important and valuable to unlocking the next advancement for their rare conditions. And with rare diseases and small patient populations, each experience and each data point provides critical insight. So working together to make sharing data easy while also ensuring that data is collected in the most usable way is the foundation needed in order to support the development of treatments that are meaningful reflecting the preferences and priorities of rare communities and making sure that those treatments are available in shorter time frames. So in other words, um, it's through this patient-driven data that we arrive at a better understanding of rare diseases, what matters to people, what we need to measure, how to design studies, and then develop the most impactful treatments. So with the right conditions and core principles upheld, some of which Carla touched on in her framing of the session, trust, authentic engagement, partnership, transparency, privacy, consent, paired with innovation and collaboration, rare disease patients and families are really powerful contributors of the information that researchers need to accelerate scientific advances. They are active and really strong advocates and truly, the power of patients cannot be underestimated. The community is key and very influential. And as researchers, we need them to be engaged. So it's this foundation and perspective paired with a deep understanding that in order to drive treatments for rare diseases, we need data on the natural history of rare conditions that really informs the design of and led to NORD to launch the I Am Rare registry program in 2014. So our adaptable infrastructure and collaborative partnership models continue to grow. We now support over 40 open-ended longitudinal natural history studies, studies that keep the data in the hands of the community. And we provide different models and designs for engagement that keep rare disease communities unified and centralized around a common mission, but allow for collaborative partnerships and use cases with different stakeholders for collecting the data, using the data, sharing the data as well. And NORD's IMR registries are leveraged for disease characterization and natural history studies for specific rare disease communities. And then through a core set of common standardized measures, certain data elements can be assessed across rare diseases as well. So the trajectory for communities that have started to collect this data in a well-designed natural history study is just remarkable. Over and over, 
we've seen communities with very little research or commercial interest launch a natural history study and within a very short period of time, six months, one year, they are launched into a new era of engagement with academic and industry partnerships, new sustainability pathways for the organization, or reshaping scientific approaches and becoming the go-to resource and reference point for the condition and patient community. Natural history studies can be a gateway to unlock partnerships, collaborations, and shared data sources. And so I'll end on this last point, but NORD's IMR program is newly being leveraged in a number of novel and innovative FDA-funded collaborations to recruit patients for research studies and collect in-depth patient preference information to support the development of meaningful and clinically relevant CLAs, to test the performance of new outcome measures, to design regulatory-grade natural history studies for external controls, and to contribute existing data for expanded use cases, informing trial optimization through the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator data and analytics platform, which my colleagues from FDA shared a bit earlier, and Jane larkin Dell from the Critical Path Institute will share more about during session four tomorrow. So there's such urgency in rare diseases, particularly because of the suffering, it can be, it can be so great. We really must work together to share the information that we have to drive progress while new tools are being developed and evidence is generated. And as researchers, we certainly have a responsibility to reduce the burden of participation, authentically build relationships and engage patients and patient organizations as active partners. Nord's message is alone we're rare, together we are strong, and the tenant carries through to the topic of our discussion today. As a rare disease community, we really are stronger when we work together. Thank you for this opportunity to share remarks. Well, thank, thank you so much, Vanessa. And if we could now have um, Petrula um, Spoko uh, from the FDA. Um, Petrula, are you? Yeah, I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and see you. Thank you. OK, great. I'm glad this worked. Um, so the technology is uh, so far uh, cooperating. So uh, thank you for this invitation. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, and this is really truly a remarkable effort to bring everybody together, um, the, this amazing community. Um, so um, in terms of um, you know, my own perspective, I'm, um, I work at the Office of New Drugs at FDA. Uh, I currently serve as the acting deputy division director on Division of Rare Diseases and Medical Genetics. Um, and really my work, um, regulatory work focuses on products that are developed or approved for treatment of rare biochemical genetic diseases, um, also known as inborn errors of metabolism. So um, I'll give you a little bit of my perspective from a scientific clinical point of view, but also a regulatory point of view. Um, so, you know, we, we all agree that sharing of data is critically important. Uh, however, the reality is that that happens to a certain degree and in certain diseases or areas, but not across the board. Um, we're dealing with diseases which are rare and some of them um, exquisitely rare. Um, and we all know that numbers matter. <clears throat> so there's certainly uh, power in numbers. Um, and this is something that really we need to drive home to everybody that um, each stakeholder alone can really not uh, produce what we need for, um, you know, to improve patients' lives. So um, there's, of course, a wealth of data out there. Uh, there's many stakeholders, many initiatives. Uh, they're really doing a fantastic work, very driven uh, to really generate information uh, so that we can really learn more about those diseases. Um, so um, really, the overarching goal is pretty simple. Um, everybody wants to learn more, to discover, but also uh, find ways to treat, um, to really um, improve the lives of the patients. So um, different stakeholders, including researchers, patient groups and patients and caregivers, drug developers, nonprofit organizations, they all offer their own perspective, which is truly unique from their point of view. Um, you know, they all really are um, striving towards this one goal, but really have complementary functions. So um, specifically about this landscape of patient level data sources, there are um, a variety of sources, obviously, we all know that. Um, 
the problem becomes that our those sources are heterogeneous, just like the diseases that we're dealing with in terms of what type of data they contain, their collection methods, their infrastructure. So the big issue becomes how can you integrate something that's so different, um, which necessitates the creation of really a unified platform. And there's many of those, some examples have already been discussed. Um, so I wanted to just touch a little bit on the different stakeholder um, involvement and contribution, which I think is really important. Um, first is the researchers. So either academia or government, like at the NIH, um, those really lay the foundation for the research and for later drug development. Um, it's very common from our work to see that um, the initial work um, for drug development starts with an individual physician who has an interest in a particular rare disease. Um, they really make it their life's work to uh, generate information, increase knowledge about this particular disease. Um, you know, their research is funded through uh, different funding mechanisms, and that's really their, um, their work, they, and they also treat patients. So later we see, you know, drug, drug developers, companies, others uh, pick up the work and really try to push it forward um, to get a drug approved. Um, and so I think a lot of this has to be focused early on um, in the sense that a lot of this data generated very early on through academic efforts has to be um, uh, very much optimized for use later, potentially for regulatory review. Um, so examples of that, which already were touched upon, is through the NCATS NIH Rare Disease Clinical Research Network and others. Um, there's, uh, of course, private and uh, nonprofit and patient groups which fund research projects uh, to generate this type of data. Um, second is really the most important stakeholder, which is really the patients, their caregivers, and the patient organizations. Um, the rare disease community is very strong. They're very driven. Um, they know that uh, those diseases are serious since a lot of them life-threatening, um, and they know that time is of the essence. So they take it upon themselves to set up and maintain their own registries to collect the data that they feel is important for everybody to know. Um, they conduct natural history studies. They fund research projects. Um, and those are different types of projects. And we, we oftentimes speak with patient organizations who come to talk to us and say, you know, you want us to, you want drug developers to look at clinically meaningful outcomes and what's clinically important to us. So this is what's important to us. Um, we have done our research. We have done either qualitative research looking at symptoms uh, or endpoints. Um, and they um, have a wealth of information and data that's really important to leverage. Um, and so, you know, there's many examples of registries um, that are up and running um, and others that are um, being established. And then lastly, um, the drug developers, the companies uh, who really spend a lot of time, effort and money, of course, in um, developing those drugs, kind of taking them into the next level, uh, putting together their package and their regulatory um, proposals, um, you know, for regulators either in the US or abroad, uh, really making the case for approval. Now, there's all kinds of studies that those drug developers conduct um, in addition to clinical trials. So we do see many times that um, a company um, who, is, who is interested in uh, really developing a drug in a rare disease, um, they may start their own natural history study or their own registry to collect data. Um, and so, uh, you know, at that stage, it's sometimes too late to really do a longitudinal natural history study. And that goes back to where we started, where really the academic research and the basic and translational science research, um, you know, is so critical. Um, so the data from clinical trials, for example, patients who are treated um, as part of a trial and are placed in placebo for a period of time, uh, trials which may not be successful um, and thus are not necessarily published or become publicly available, this data is, is lost now and is really not utilized to the best potential. 
So that's another resource and source of data that um, is generally not very well used. Um, um, just a, a last point I wanted to make about registries. Um, you know, we hear a, a lot about registries. They are very important. Um, you know, their utility and their usefulness and our ability to use them really depend upon um, how they're structured, their data collection, their protocols, objectives, of course, many, many different elements. And I think later on today and tomorrow, others will touch upon that. But really a registry, all it is, is really just a systematic collection of any type of data. Um, it's just kind of a repository of, of data that others can uh, leverage for any type of uh, study. Um, so I think um, in nowadays where we talk about this uh, concept of real world data or real world evidence, I think registries are part of that. Um, I think people um, really need to be very thoughtful when they're designing and conducting a registry. Make sure they have a research question in mind instead of blind, blindingly collected any type of data that they can, because we know that those patients are really um, valuable because they're so rare. So um, working together and sharing all this data and making sure that whatever registry or other you know, studies are conducted are done well and conducted well uh, because just of utmost importance. So um, I will stop there. Um, I would say that, um, again, power is in the numbers. And so I think I strongly encourage, and we all do at FDA, for folks to come together and really work with each other. And one part of that is really sharing all the data they have. Thanks. Thank, thank you so much, Petroa. Um, so uh, last by not, but not least, if uh, we could uh, turn over to Petra Kaufman from Avexis. Petra, we can see you. You don't seem to be on mute, but we cannot hear you. Let's try again. How about this? Oh, there you go. There we go. Well, good, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this really important uh, event. Data sharing is something that um, I've thought about for a number of years uh, from different perspectives in academia, at the NIH, and now in industry. Uh, I currently head uh, clinical development and translational medicine um, at Avexis, which is a Novartis company focused on gene therapy. And having taken care of patients with rare neurological diseases, um, it, it's always been clear to me uh, that it is so important that we accelerate the process because for many of these patients, there is really um, no treatment available. And um, Tula just said strength is in the numbers. It's also the other way around. Um, if you think about patients, there are often only very small numbers of patients. However, for a family um, affected by an ultra rare disease, the suffering is just as great as you know whether there are a hundred others or a thousand others or ten thousand others. So we have to keep in mind that every data point has to count um, because. By definition, they are talking about rare diseases and sharing data for rare diseases. So it's really critical to get anywhere and to get there within the unacceptable time frame. So I um, really want to thank the other panelists and, and so many um, important points have been covered. What I'd like to add, I think, um, is really the drug development perspective. Why is it so important that we have um, high quality data that are really fit for purpose for drug development. Um, you know, and in drug development, there's different um, reasons why we would need such data. For trial planning, that is very uncontroversial. It is clear that we need to have robust, high quality data. What I see sometimes now when we look at a rare disease and consider how we could approach it um, is that there are natural history studies, but they are actually not quite fit for purpose. For example, the data quality, the missingness of data. So if there is um, a large ambitious plan of collecting many different variables, but then only very few actually were completed because of maybe the burden or other of the many obstacles that so many of 
the other speakers have mentioned already, and that's not as useful. The visit frequency can be an issue. So if we have uh, studies of registries with annual visits, understandable because of the burden to participants, to the research teams, of the cost involved. But for trial planning, we would really want to see rather not such an extensive data collection, rather not such a long 15-year collection, but rather a shorter one to two-year time frame with more frequent, robust, complete, and high-quality data. So for, for a trial planning, very uncontroversial, these data are critical and they can make the difference in making it tractable for us to um, work on a given indication or not. And they make it um, make a huge difference in terms of how quickly we can get there. Patula mentioned earlier uh, that it's really too late when the sponsor has a potential treatment and has to then start collecting natural history data. But sadly, in rare diseases where the resources often have not been available to do these kinds of data collections, that sometimes is the case. And it's um, unfortunate if that becomes the sort of critical path uh, bottleneck there. Um, things that are you know, more complicated, more controversial um, arise when we deal with ultra rare diseases where it is often not really possible or very challenging to have a full scale clinical trial with um, you know, a comparator arm concurrently. That's of course the gold standard, but sometimes difficult or or just for ethical reasons, if there's no other treatment difficult. So here we have to even consider using uh, historical data from natural history studies from registries um, as comparators. And that's a, a great challenge because there could be you know, historical trends or participation uh, bias. So here we need to really ensure that the data are um, you know, complete and of high quality and, and sufficient. Um, and, and sometimes, um, you know, when, when there are different sources of data, uh, it could be extremely helpful as, of course, a bit, you know, utopia, but it could be extremely helpful if data standards were used um, that would make it uh, much uh, more feasible and, and would take less time and resources to get the kinds of data sets that we need. Another issue could be the, um, and this was mentioned by some of the other speakers as well, the uh, ethical uh, and contractual requirements. So if patients uh, could be consented um, in a way that would be, uh, would give them the option to uh, be open to this kind of data sharing, not of course identified, but be identified uh, patient level data sharing, that could be very useful. Sometimes everybody is willing to share data, but the consent wasn't uh, quite uh, set up in that way. Um, so standards, consenting would be very important and also consider um, agreements um, among parties that would really allow the use of the data for what they're ultimately intended for. So I think, you know, the patients who uh, altruistically give their time uh, to these natural history data studies, I think they expect of all of us to make the best possible use of the data. So if we can set it up right, we can get data that are fit for purpose for drug development, not only uh, potentially for, um, his, uh, for trial planning, but also for use as historical control data or to augment uh, concurrent control data. It could, it could allow you to have a smaller number of patients randomized to a comparator or control arm, uh, then you can anchor that back into high quality data. So I think I, I um, you know, stop here and hand it back to you, Martha. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Petra. So um, we will be able to now move to a discussion session until uh, 2.45, I'm sorry, 3.15, I'm sorry, 3.15. So we have over half an hour um, allotted for this discussion. So, um, you know, normally what we will do in a, uh, in a non-virtual setting when we're actually able to do it in person is that we will usually have a true round table if you've been at uh, Duke Margolis offices um, and then the speakers can all see each other and you'll have if, if it's at a conference uh, in a hotel room you will also see the panelists sitting together so it's hard to recreate it with zoom uh, when you look at the gallery view we don't fit all on one uh, screen so we're going to try to sort of modify the experience sort of uh, try to mock up this experience a little bit. So if I could ask all of this session to participants 
to go on video now. So we will, this, uh, hopefully now we will all show up um, on the first screen. Um, great. And then, um, you know, I will ask a couple of questions and then we will um, uh, invite all the other roundtable uh, participants as well. Uh, uh, when a roundtable participant would like to speak, you know, if you could raise your hand, but in particular, if you can go on video, we will then see you on the first screen. And if you are uh, um, uh, someone who is uh, not a panelist and a roundtable participant, but viewing uh, this uh, externally, if you could uh, either, again, send an email with a question uh, to rd.data at duke.edu um, or put it in the in the chat box. So let me kick it off with a couple of, uh, of questions and then I will um, turn it uh, over. And again, um, folks can not only just offer remarks, but if you have questions for others as well, um, roundtable participants are also welcome uh, to, to do that. So Patrol, if you don't mind, if I could start um, with you. Um, something that you said early on in your remarks is you talked about how in some rare diseases, you do see a lot of data sharing, but not in others. What is it about those settings that makes it different? Can you offer, do you see some patterns there? Is it the disease itself? Is it something about what kinds of participants are in there? Um, I, I wonder if you have any insight on that. Yeah, so, so that's an interesting question. Um, so I think a lot of times it has to do with the community itself. Um, so what we see is different diseases and the community associated with that, patients, their caregivers, their parents or families, um, um, you, know, ha you know, have a little bit of a different psychology, so to speak. So um, for example, um, the types of diseases may also dictate that. So you have some rare diseases where um, they have this neurodegenerative course, which starts in childhood. So um, the urgency and the, you know, um, um, uh, I guess degree of involvement and drive that those parents have uh, may be quite different than another disease where, for example, it is a um, kind of milder, more slowly progressive disease in adults. Um, and so, um, you know, I think it's just, I would say the dynamics um, can differ very much across diseases and in the patient groups or even the academicians and physicians um, who take part in generating that data. Um, so um, we see, for example, uh, you know, a great example that we all use, and I know people have used that before, is a children's oncology group. Um, you know, we all recognize that childhood cancer is devastating, right? And so when you're a parent of a child with cancer, you do anything uh, to find a cure. Um, I think there's been tremendous amount of work in that area decades ago uh, to really drive home the message that, you know, those are all rare diseases, right? All, all cancer in childhood is rare. And so um, they were able to come together as a community and really share what they have um, and so I think they really had this common perspective of this is childhood cancer, you know, we all understand it. How can we work together? Um, sometimes in rare diseases, you know, there's some rare diseases that are just so different than some others, you know, some in kids, some in adults, some rapidly progressive, slowly progressive. And so it becomes difficult to um, kind of um, work together when there's just so many different perspectives. Um, so I think it, it really takes a lot of effort and I would say education um, and initiative to bring those folks together. And it could very well be that some of this sharing has to happen by disease group or disease category or bringing those types of stakeholders together who may have some more common perspectives. I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, it's a complicated question, but I think you know, it may be that our diseases are just so heterogeneous in and of themselves that aggregating all this data is really a true challenge and may need to come into small pieces and then eventually come together. I think another uh, observation maybe is that oftentimes when um, there is one umbrella patient organization uh, that, that seems to 
um, you know, help with progress rather than multiple different ones working uh, more independently. So, um, I, I know I, I, I'm, I'm hearing your ears seeing some messages. messages. There's, there's some maybe feedback coming, coming from it, but I think it will be a little bit too dangerous for me to try to disconnect the people in the studio. So, uh, I apologize for this. Um, so, um, so, um, well, thank, thank you. Thank you, Petra, and Chola. And, and, and the next I'd like to ask you a question that we're going to do to be coming back over the next session to talk about the next session and then we're going to do to be coming back over the next session to talk about analyzing data. But, but uh, uh, I guess a, a, a question, question to, to, to propose for you is, is how, how do we balance and ensure that we honor patients' preference and the rights, rights to the ownership of their personal um, information data? data? Marta? Yeah. Uh, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. This is Teresa. I wonder, the sound is quality is deteriorating for you. And I wondered, would it be good to take a little early break and come back to this panel because uh, and just to see if we could fix your audio issue, because um, it's becoming a little hard to understand you. I mean, just a thought. I don't know what you can do. You are critical to this. Would you mind us asking a couple of questions? Which I was actually just the next time we can make it again. Hey, Marty. Yeah, Hey, Marta. Yeah, it, it is pretty difficult to hear you, but we do have a, a question for Vanessa. And, and Vanessa, I, I did uh, try to type it into chat here, but it relates to data anonymization and uh, in part kind of picking up on what Petra was asking. Um, can you all hear me okay? Is my audio okay? Okay, great. Um, but, you know, if we're, it's clear that, you know, data anonymization will come up in, in the next few sessions, and we want to make sure that we're really teeing up, you know, how we balance um, and ensure you know data protection and privacy um, for patients um, with the real need you know and, and benefits of sharing uh, data and providing open access to data. Um, so we're hoping that you could you know provide a couple comments and, and we can hear from the group as well on that um, with respect to you know how do, how do we strike that balance? What do we need to do? What are the considerations um, with respect to uh, making sure that everything is protected and and also you know openly shared uh, so we can maximize its utility? Yeah. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, great. That'll be the, the running theme for the day, I think. Um, so, yeah, thanks for the question. So, um, I have, I guess, two thoughts around this. And one is, is just that certainly there are best practices and experts who are working on, you know, informed consent or legal and ethical considerations for data sharing. But I would also argue, I think that patients and patient organizations really should be centered as part of the solution because sort of those thresholds of, you know, where um, patients or families or, um, you know, participants in a certain study feel, feel most comfortable sharing their data and, and how they feel most comfortable sharing their data, I think could be designed collaboratively. And someone earlier, I think it was Petra, had raised that considerations very early on in the study are important. So considerations just like this, like what exactly, you know, planning in advance, what exactly you want to be able to do with the data, how you want to, how you're envisioning using the data, who you're envisioning using the data for what use cases, and then really designing sort of pretty holistically or at least open-ended enough that you could make those um, determinations at a future date in the study. So consent, for example, about how to use the data or, how, or the ability to share de-identified data for a future use case or use purpose is critically important. Otherwise, we, we have seen examples of organizations or groups that have sort of stumbled into wanting to share their data, but then have felt restricted or been restricted by the consent that they offered to their community and I've had to go through a whole cycle of reconsenting their participants. And then I guess this sort of the last point I just, um, wanted to raise is that the data data that's collected by and sort of owned by the community in patient registries or natural history studies really over and over again we hear that it's meant to be used as broadly as possible right like these are the patients and families that want the treatments they want they want as much progress to be made as possible for their condition so um I, yeah i think just in terms of like data use, it's important that, that patients and patients organ, patient organizations are involved because 
when they design their studies, or at least they're part of designing studies, um, you know, their requirements can be met, but then also the data can be, is, is intended to be collected, to be used and shared as broadly as possible. And so, so let me try one more time. How is the sound right now? Okay, great. That's better, I don't, yeah. just restarting the whole thing, uh, whole thing works. Actually, at this point, I have, I have a number of, I, I could ask a, a number of questions of the panelists, but I would like to give uh, the group an opportunity to speak. Now that I have logged out, I seem to have lost some of the questions that were asked. I do remember that there was a question for Katie um, about the Yoda project. Katie, I'm not sure if you saw that question earlier on in the Q&A, um, because this I don't be see for, it any for, longer. For Carla, thanks, Marta. I just wanted to jump in. This one will be for Carla for the Yoda project. And um, oh, Carla, sorry, Carla, sorry. Carla's yeah. going to answer that. Sorry. Do you have a hold of that question? Yeah, I think it was uh, the, the question from Tim Herring that I flagged to answer yes, live. Yes, that's correct. Yep. That's correct. Um, sorry, my so bad. Rolling back up to it, uh, about 10% of Yoda project trials have been published. Um, I, I, and feel free to clarify. So we've had about 180 some odd research proposals and 37 publications. So that's 20% of the research proposals submitted that have resulted in a publication. There are about 313, I guess that's not roughly, that's exactly 313 trials, unique trials that were parts of those research proposals. So the publication rate's not, not been 10%, it's been about 20%. But to your point, um, I don't know that we've seen a publication bias per se, but what we've observed are a couple of things, definitely a time lag. So much like anybody conducting thoughtful research with getting a hold of data, there's going to be a little bit of a lag. We've been doing this for about six years. And in truth, like the first 18 months to two years, we didn't see any publications. Now we're starting to see a steady stream each month of several publications coming out. So I do think we're seeing the publication lag. Occasionally we see a drop off in researcher engagement Engagement. They submit a research proposal, they get access, and then for whatever reason, we follow up and there are a variety of reasons. So I think primarily it's probably the lag in access to data and then researcher ability to spend time on it. But now we're really actually seeing a steady stream of publications coming out each month. So actually, Carla, I have a, a, a follow-up question related sort of to the academic incentives. Um, so uh, clearly there's been a lot more encouragement in uh, publishing and actually publishing potentially negative results. Um, uh, uh, you know, Jim talked about actually starting uh, a whole new journal so that academics have an output. Um, but there's, I, I guess, this, this question that you still have to finish the study and, you know, is, is there a need to be sharing data even earlier and do the sort of academic uh, incentives? And this, might, this is a question for Carla, for Jim, and for, I think, a lot of the researchers in there. Uh, the fact that you might potentially have a publication maybe even ready, but you can publish it and share the, the information with anybody until actually the journal publishes it. To what extent are some of these sort of structural academic uh, uh, publication uh, 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 norms um, uh, an issue um, still going on, or is this something that we have sort of gotten past? I'm, I'm curious what the group thinks. I'll make a comment from a, more of an industry perspective and what we face. So one of the criterion that we use for sharing data is that the product or the indication should be approved. So part of responsible data sharing is respecting the role of the health authority to evaluate the benefit risk. So up until the point of time that marketing approval is, we, we typically don't share data before that, during that investigational period. The exception we do occasionally make to that is if we choose to, for a public health need, publish the results of something before it's approved, we will try to make the data underlying that publication available for sharing with the, and that's consistent with the Institute of Medicine report saying, if you're willing to make the results public in advance of marketing approval, then you should be willing to allow others to look at those data and critique it. And, and so I don't know if that's exactly what you're looking at. I'd be interested to hear Jim's perspective, but there are some of those challenges of, ongoing trials before health authorities have had a chance to review and some of those important considerations. But for things like um, our multi-drug resistant tuberculosis drug, our hep C product that where it's so dynamic and things are changing so rapidly, we've been able to move up 
the timeline for data sharing. So Jim, I see you've come off. Sure. If you want to refer. I, you know, in, in the past, it's been a real problem because <clears throat> some journals would not accept a paper if there was a pre-disclosure of the data, e e even sometimes in a, in, in a formal presentation, which was exactly uh, the wrong thing to do. Uh, that's changed. Uh, now it's fine if you present at a scientific conference. But there's a new phenomenon, and, and there are these uh, uh, bioarchives. There, there are these data, uh, uh, Cold Spring Harbor has one, it's called BioRxIV, where uh, if you have a manuscript just written, you can deposit it for, uh, for uh, and anyone can, can get access to it, while you then uh, continue to then pursue its publication in a peer-reviewed journal. This has been a game changer for COVID, absolute game changer. Absolutely. We are constantly, everyone's looking at these, uh, at these free print uh, 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 sites where we get access to data almost as soon as they write the manuscript up. It's pretty hard to do it beforehand. And fortunately, the journals do not often preclude peer-reviewed publication of something that's been disclosed. So that's a, that's a new development and, and COVID has uh, really uh, benefited from that. But you know, there is, uh, there's risk because then anyone can put anything up there. And that's where the peer review part of it is. But I guess in this day and age, we sort of leave it up to the reviewer or the viewer, or the reader uh, to determine uh, how valid they think the results are. So, you know, things are changing in that, uh, in that regard. And, and, just, and just one other com uh, comment about, about industry. I, uh, Carla, I, I appreciate the position that pharma takes with respect to uh, disclosure. My experience on the uh, early uh, biotech space, it's quite the opposite. <laughs> that they're, they're pushing us to publish papers because it's news flow and it gets uh, uh, recognition for their, uh, for, their, for their company. So I haven't been stifled at all in, in collaborating with, with, uh, with biotech and, uh, and, and, and disclosing information. It's only limited by filing your patent, really. There's no, you know, many, many, companies that I've worked with waited for the 18 month period for the patent, you know, necessarily to be published where, you know, sort of the cat's out of the bag then. But that, but that isn't the case for biotech. Great. So um, I see that uh, there's a couple of other questions in the uh, Q&A. So one question is, is there a good review available on the limitations and shortcomings of registries? Just figuring out how to unmute myself. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so we uh, actually, I don't know if this is a setup, but we actually just published a paper um, earlier this year that really looked, um, you know, not at specific models, but really looked at what some of the sort of cross-cutting challenges and benefits are to setting up patient registries, both in the US and also with a, a sort of global lens as well. So I'm happy to share that out as a, as a resource. Um, it was published in Farm Pharmaceutical Medicine. Um, I'm happy to share that out as a resource after the call, but um, maybe that's one, one starting point. And I could perhaps also add uh, the uh, Office of Rare Diseases Research has uh, RADA, which is a um, rare disease registry program uh, that is online that you can check out. Uh, it's uh, registries um, at nih.gov or some, you, you'll find it there that has some advice and, and tools on setting up good quality registries. Yeah, and I would add, um, this is uh, Petrula, I would add that there's <clears throat> probably a wealth of information on registries and other studies. If uh, one just types in PubMed or Google Scholar, there's actually very good articles um, on different epidemiologic studies, um, including registries. So, yeah. I'd also like to add that the FDA has some guidances out on rare disease drug developments. Um, I think there's a series of them that um, mention some of the challenges or things to think about um, when doing rare disease drug development and registries and, and natural history studies are touched in that. 
And, and Vanessa, I think you had, uh, uh, you wanted to add something to perhaps a previous discussion. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I just had a question actually to post to the group. So I, um, I can't pretend to have the answer to it, so I'll ask the question instead. <laughs> but I'm, yeah, I'm wondering if um, the panelists have considered the breakdown of our study samples. So, for example, any biases that are sort of persistent in the, the study samples that we have collected to date or skewedness in the study samples you know, patterns of rep non-representativeness will just be repeated by continuing to share data sets that are perhaps less diverse than they could be. And certainly that's something we all should be more intentional about um, at the start when we're designing our studies in terms of, you know, inclusivity and engagement. But I'm curious if anyone has thoughts about sort of what that means as we are starting to combine and leverage existing data sets that exist that may not be quite as representative as we would want them to be. Vanessa, I, I don't think I have a solution, but I know we've been trying to create, we've been seeing a lot of artificial intelligence machine learning requests come in and for access to that and have been trying to think through the different checklists and controls to have in place of how do you think about whether or not you're replicating the bias? How do, why are you selecting this particular set? So I don't know that we have a, a great answer to it, but we've been trying to just increase awareness and education around it as we internally have been thinking and thinking about it externally as we make data sets available. But I, I think it's an important, an important question that goes into some of the artificial intelligence machine learning projects we've been seeing. I don't know if others have had experiences with that. So I, I don't have a great solution, but we've just been mainly trying to create awareness. Anyone else has uh, thoughts on Vanessa's question? I guess we'll have to do more thinking about it. Maybe we can bring up this, uh, this topic in, in, in further sessions. Um, uh, so let me turn to, to the Q&A um, that's in the, in the chat. Um, there's a question now I'm finding, the question for Katie. Katie, is your team doing any work on coordinating discussions on rare diseases as trial um, enrollment criteria? so that they are not too restrictive. And we just had Katie and she disappeared from the screen. So I don't know whether she had to drop up just a second ago. I just saw her here a second ago. Okay, so we will we'll skip this, uh, this question um, because I'm, I understood that she needed to leave. I just didn't know at which time and I think it must have been 3 p.m. All right, um, so another question is, what do the panelists think of finding agreement on a GUID or universal ID for rare disorders that would be the GP, uh, uh, GDPR compliant and could link rare patients across studies? Um, so I can start a little bit. I know that um, Jane Larkindale and the Critical Path Institute have thought about this a little bit and maybe they can comment on it um, as well. Um, so uh, how some of that goes is the common question is, is if we're pulling together multiple data sets, you may have the same person contributing data into different data sets. And how do we know that, you know, it's the same person and, and kind of is this the answer that can help us? Um, and I think we need to explore that some more, particularly as we continue to encourage data sharing and we're getting more data sets, the likelihood of one person being in multiple data sources is highly likely. Um, and so I think it's something to think about. Um, and so I would like to hear what the other panelists have to say, but I do know that some people have been starting to think about that because that is um, a question that comes up a lot, particularly when we've recently been talking about the rare disease cures data analytics platform. This is a question that's come up a lot is, well, you know, what if one person is contributing data in multiple data sets and how do we know? Um, so I will defer to the rest of the panel, but I do know it's something that um, we may have to think about um, as we continue to embed this concept of data sharing and the importance of it. Can any, anyone else uh, willing to weigh in on this topic?
As Michelle just brought my name up, I will comment just briefly. I believe this question came from Terry Jo Michelle, who I've had many conversations on this topic already. <laughs> uh, it is not a simple topic, but as Michelle said, we are, we are working on it, trying to talk to the community about figuring out some kind of GUID or GUID system that can be used in various rare diseases to address this problem. It's probably going to be a system based on specific questions that are asked in multiple studies to develop a new GUID. And there's a group at, at Harvard Mass General that's also been working on this a lot and we've been talking to a lot. So I don't have a good, great answer now, but hopefully within the next year or so, we will have better answers to that question. And this is Tina from NCATS. I know that the NIH is also working on a platform rather than having individual GUID generators for each of the different programs. What it would be more is a central um, generator type thing. Please bear with me if I'm speaking incorrectly, but it, it's, a, it's a more of a central generator that the other groups link into. So you have your individual projects, but there the central site is able to tell if you're in multiple projects across a network, for example, our RDCRN network. So, and they're reaching out to multiple institutes and multiple different studies and groups to try to build out instead of inward. Thanks, Gina. And, and thanks, Jane, for jumping in because remember um, the entire roundtable is um, welcome at the roundtable, um, not, not just the uh, panelists uh, in this discussion session. So we invite everybody um, uh, everybody to, to chime in. Uh, so um, I wanted to um, ask uh, actually a question um, of uh, Jim and, and think about some of the um, gene therapy, um, uh, cell therapy, um, uh, cell therapies, and thinking about how do we think about um, post sort of uh, assessing long-term uh, efficacy of uh, and sort of the the of, of these uh, drugs. Do we have uh, the right pathways and tools to uh, monitor? Uh, that or do we do we need more? Do we have the infrastructure for it already? Yeah, I mean, uh, you can still hear me, okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Yeah, um, you know the the one thing that is different about cell and gene therapy than traditional uh, small molecule and protein therapeutics is the requirement for long term follow up. That's right. And, and and this is primarily related to safety issues, uh, uh, stemming from some initial observations from the first successful ex vivo gene therapy studies where patients developed leukemia. And they are, um, uh, there is guidance from uh, health authorities on how to do this, but I don't think there's anything really particularly special about it. There are common uh, types of follow-ups that are, that are necessary. I, I think the other area about longer term follow-up though that may be uh, touching upon another important aspect of uh, cell and gene therapies in which there is potentially uh, durable uh, efficacy, if not uh, the prospect for a cure, is, is the notion of assessing on an ongoing basis, is this still continuing to work? And where that becomes important is a lot of discussion on how to reimburse or price for cell and gene therapy, which is uh, one, one approach is an, an annuity-based system rather than a large upfront payment, uh, that there would be a payment each year based on the demonstration that the intervention continues to show benefit. Uh, and, and there's a lot, been a lot of discussion about that. I think that's particularly challenging because that's an ongoing assessment of efficacy that's gonna be different from each, for each disease and it may actually be quite onerous. So not a particular expert in that, but I, I, I thought I would bring that up as, as two, uh, two sides of the coin. Okay. Okay. And anyone else has thoughts about how the, um, you know, the gene, uh, gene therapies and, and uh, cell therapies sort of fit in this um, scheme and how it might be different? And it's so critical that, right, to have long-term follow-up, as Jim mentioned, for safety, for efficacy. Some of these uh, gene cell therapy or other of the newer uh, kind of more, uh, you know, uh, technologies, right, uh, are have very little experience today. So it's very important for everybody, for the whole field, 
for patients to understand what's happening uh, more longer term. And uh, some of these are one-time therapies, so there is no incentive necessarily even during a trial for the families to you know, come back. Uh, so how can we engage with patients? How can we make it easy? The pandemic, I think, has uh, given an opportunity for some disruptive innovation because I really need to think about decreasing the burden, allowing for more remote-based or somehow digitally um, collected uh, patient-reported outcomes or activity measures so that we don't have to have families um, travel to sometimes far away clinics uh, to give us uh, updates on how they are doing. Um, so I think this is a really important area. And I think the more we can um, connect the dots, the more we could have in a perfect world, they would be sort of registries and natural history studies that are harmonized. And then the trial sort of using the same space of how we collect data in terms of outcome measures, and then ideally, afterwards any kind of registry follow-up would be connected that would really give the disease community the most benefit of the information and would allow you to really see the impact of a particular treatment over time yeah. comparing it to how was it before or even registries then of people who choose not to be treated with this or that and see how they're faring so if we can connect the dots collaborate, harmonize. Um, I think that would be very helpful to patients and give them the information we'd all love to have um, in terms of the impact of these new treatments. Yeah, so that, that's interesting, Petra. You know, you're highlighting that here the incentives might be somewhat different for patients. Generally, patients are very motivated until they get to get access to therapy. Here, the patients got access to therapy. We need data sharing after the patients got um, access to it, and uh, you're sort of highlighting, and actually, you know, um, Jim also spoke uh, about some of the uh, factors that COVID has brought to bear, and so now we're doing a lot more telehealth. Uh, you know, we, we started publishing in a different way. Um, I also wanted to ask sort of, are there other lessons learned from uh, COVID uh, around data sharing on the pre-competitive side, on some of the legal um, side in terms of how we make agreements? Um, are there lessons learned? Because it, it really does seem that COVID has really shaken up the way we do things. And the question is, what can be learned from that for the purposes of data sharing in the rare, uh, rare disease space? Not a specific question to anybody. I'm opening it up to the whole group. Well, Marta, I actually have a slightly different twist on that question um, to, to the panelists about uh, sustainability of registries and platforms and, and when we're data sharing because you know conceptually it's we're giving data at a one time but we know data grows improves we've collected more data our observational studies get more data our registries get more data um, even in the current COVID world we're still getting new data every day and learning more from it so I didn't know if um, you know Carla has any thoughts or Tina and Vanessa who are kind of working in different uh, sectors that are either sharing data or collecting data about how do we sustain these platforms and data collection opportunities to keep them up to date and relevant for things like if a pandemic happens and what can we do lessons learned and learning from them to help us inform the future. Um, oh, go ahead, Tina, you go first. Oh, so what I was going to say, um, it's in line with the COVID and the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network. We have 20 consortia that are up and running and they all have patient advocacy groups that are connected to them. So when we wanted to start a COVID study, we just reached out to our PIs and, you know, we listened to what their problems were and they told us. So we initially came up with a survey and we reached out to the advocacy groups and to the PIs, and they were all about it. We have about 3,500 responses, which in rare disease is pretty good. And what we've been able to tack onto it, because it was such a coordinated group, was a zero study where there's going to be a longitudinal zero study that will be contacting the people who were contacted through our study basically, and who have agreed to be recontacted. So they have the opportunity to participate in this. And for us, what was wonderful about it is 
this is the first time in 15 years that we were able to get these rare disease groups to find a commonality. Unfortunately, it was COVID that, you know, this is impacting you not in the same disease way, but it impacts all of your lives in various ways. And you have more in common than the general population has in common with you. So it, it provided an opportunity to be, you know, I hate to use the term shovel ready, but we were prepared to jump right in. It just took weeks to get us up and going as opposed to a long period of time to try to recruit, to, to build relationships and such, so. Carla, go ahead and, and then we'll probably. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add briefly and I'll maybe chat into the, uh, or include in the chat a link to a public reference, but we've observed some really interesting patient-directed data capture platforms being used in the COVID registry that's similar to what Tina was describing, that how do you create an ongoing longitudinal cohort of individuals who could be activated for research and sort of have their health record data that um, is one of the primary sources coming in, but other ways of engaging with them. So I think we've seen a lot of creativity and leveraging real world data sources, patient outreach and virtual engagement. Um, and I'll, I'll, while we're on the next break, I'll, I'll find some references to that and just so folks can take a look at it because it's, some interesting, it's an interesting approach in technology to engaging and then again, having ready for future resource an engaged group of folks that you can continue to work with over time. And, and Carla, just really quickly, if I may ask, and are you seeing also changes on uh, more on sort of the, the, the way, for example, the legal folks engage and, and tell, tell uh, in COVID what you can and cannot do. Um, uh, do you see changes sort of recently in the COVID space about sort of how we can pre-competitively -pre engage or is it simply because the FTC and the Department of Justice has issued specific guidance saying, no, you can actually work together and you can come together as industry. Uh, so is COVID unusual like this, or, or, or do you actually think that there's a different way of thinking about things now? I think there's been an interesting motivator to try to get people to take down some barriers that might have been there before, and I think it'll be an interesting thing to see if we can capitalize on that momentum with this sort of burning platform of needing to work together and how can we be more efficient. So I've personally seen more creativity in trying to overcome some of those legal hurdles and what can we put in place to have appropriate protection. So my hope is that we don't lose the opportunity when hopefully the public health emergency goes away, that we've learned where we can be more creative. And Jim, I think you've got, you know, just even your experience of how can we take down some of those pre-competitive barriers and really share things like assays and tests and things that shouldn't be sort of parceled off and, and deemed competitive and how can we be more collaborative. So I've seen positive movement in that space. Um, and I do think anytime we can have clear, clear guidance on what that space looks like to play in appropriately helps. And, and I see Jeff jumped on video, so he would like to chime in as well. Please go ahead. Uh, I'm just not sure that we answered Michelle's question because she asked a really good question about the sustainability of some of the data. And maybe in other words, if I'm paraphrasing, does the data have an expiration date? And I could tell you from what some of the things that we do at CPATH, when you're building models that try to recapitulate the standard of care, the standard of care is, is always a snapshot in time. So I think this concept is actually very relevant. So uh, from the data standpoint, we simply have to have a way of, of flagging the data to know, you know, at what point is it relevant? At what point does it reflect some normative uh, uh, utilization or uh, otherwise uh, a baseline that we can actually make comparisons to? So I, I think we do have to consider down the road this idea of a data expiration and, and how do we in fact separate data longitudinally when it's more or less informative. Yeah, and so this is actually a great segue for our next session, which is really uh, much more about operationalizing uh, all that we have discussed. So we, we definitely need data sharing now. How do we operationalize it to maximize the value of it? So um, why don't we break uh, for 12 minutes? We will start, um, so we're a couple of minutes behind. We will start at uh, 3.30 sharp and dive in, and some of, the, some of this discussion can carry on um, to the next session as well. So thank you. All right, we're at uh, 3.30, or I guess maybe even 3.31. So if we could move to the next session, to session three. So um, again, welcome back, and uh, thank you so much for great presentations and discussion in sessions one and two. Um, so this session will focus on the operational considerations for ensuring quality in data collection and the management of shared data resources. 
Our speaker for this session is Jeff Barrett, um, who actually had the last word in the previous session. Uh, he's the senior advisor on quantitative medicine at the Critical Path Institute. And then we will have several panelists, Lori Conklin, uh, who is the Vice President, Medical and Regulatory Affairs at Revira Gen, uh, Sam Hume, who is the Vice President um, of Data Science at CDISC, Ron Bartek, who is the President and Director and Co-Founder of the uh, Friedrich um, Ataxia Research Alliance, Srujal uh, Baxi, who is the um, Senior Medical Director at Flatron, Flatron Health, and Mathilde Cam, who is the Associate Director in the Office of Biostatistics at the MDA. So I will turn the microphone over to Jeff. Okay, great. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I also want to give a shout out to my colleague, Amanda Borens, who was originally scheduled to give this talk, but I'm, I'm delighted that she recommended me to do so. So we've been talking for the last few hours about, about data, the need to share data, but I think we all recognize the, the quality piece of this is an expectation that, that just has to be there. And I think the, the extent to which we actually demonstrate this is, is really an issue. And I'm going to go over some really uh, touch points on a lot of this area, but this is a very deep and, and technical field. So uh, I probably won't go down too many rabbit holes, but uh, suffice it to say, if that's where we want to go, we can absolutely get there. So next slide. We can skip through this. I don't need to tell you what I'm going to show you. I need to just show it to you. Uh, just a reminder about, about the Critical Path Institute. So uh, you may have heard our colleagues at FDA refer to us as this honest broker, and that is absolutely what uh, Critical Path intends to be for, for data of various therapeutic areas, uh, both from the standpoint of, of sharing, managing it, but also providing it to different levels of users. So there is really this uh, three-headed beast that we try to, uh, to maintain at, at CPATH, and that is expertise in the data sciences around this issue of sharing, management of data, standardization, curation. All of these are the relevant backbones around the data that we ingest and then we bring in from various sources. Quantitative sciences, again, Dr. Donahue, uh, she's head of our marketing group at FDA. She did a, a great job showing you a few screenshots from some of the tools that we built in close collaboration with our regulatory colleagues. So I'll take you a little bit behind the curtain to talk about that in more detail, but suffice it to say, in order for us to use the data with any kind of fidelity and, and expectation that it means something, the data has to be of high quality. So there is a, an exact expectation from the standpoint of quantitative sciences that the quality around the data science has to be there. And then the third piece of this is obviously on the regulatory sciences. If someone is going to make decisions either based on the data or the tool, there is also an implicit understanding that um, the traceability there, the, the audit trail, all the expectations on the, uh, the fidelity around the tool and the data have to be there in order to use it for this purpose. Next slide. I wanted to give you just a, a little bit of context. So this may appear to be kind of the, uh, the logistics around when we start a project, particularly on building a tool in collaboration with regulatory authorities. And, and again, we tend to focus on our, our close collaboration with FDA, but uh, CPATH obviously works with a, a variety of regulatory authorities, EMA, uh, PMDA, IMI. So there's, uh, this really goes really in a, in a global direction around the issue of data sharing across many therapeutic areas. But the, the process is that uh, there's a discussion and a, a very candid dialogue around the context of use for any of the tools that we build, as well as what the quality has to be in the underlying data sources. So this is a, a back and forth negotiation. So there's a dialogue that happens in which all of these expectations are, are discussed in detail. So things like the anonymization of, of the data, uh, privacy issues, uh, security, all of this is, is part of an upfront dialogue that is a clear expectation that has to be built into the actual project as, as we build these tools. Likewise, the user, the eventual user of the tool, be it uh, pharmaceutical sponsor, be it regulatory authorities, be it the academic communities, we really have to get a, a, a good feeling for what is the uh, diversity of the user? What is their expertise? Am I going to create different views of the underlying tool set and or data based on the uh, sophistication of the user? 
And then finally, this uh, formal acceptance of the tool. So there, there's a very well-established process here. This is not something that happens either in a vacuum or without a lot of a dialogue and agreement. And the other thing to consider here is that it's not just the data that has to be of high quality. As we're building tools and models that are built on the data, these two carry the same expectations that there's a very well-established uh, agreement on the validation, the qualification, and the, the final uh, agreement on, on the performance of the tool. Next slide. The dirty work behind the scenes is, is also in, in managing everything from the, the data use agreements, the transfer of the data, the ingestion of the data in our secure environment, the extent to which we curate and standardize data, and also provide it in an aggregated form. So there's uh, performance gains that are be being made as you ensure each of these steps, but eventually this a final product is, is the, the derivation of, of the analysis data sets that are used in, in different tools or for different level of users. So each one of these steps requires a very predefined expectation in terms of the quality, as well as the, the format type of the different uh, data stores that are being um, basically evolved over time as we, as we build the tool set. So we can ensure at any stage that um, the data meets the quality expectations, but at the end of the day, we have to make sure that, uh, again, this process is robust it happens in a time-friendly manner, so it's obviously not a place where anybody wants to see the hourglass spinning around because they're waiting for things. So that performance piece of this is not trivial and, and has to be built in both the tools that we build as well as how we care for the data. Next slide. So uh, on the left-hand side, and, and this again was a slide that Dr. Donish you, you showed, so uh, again, just to recapitulate this, CPATH doesn't turn any data away. So from the standpoint of the diversity data, it is very diverse. Now, if we're talking about clinical trial data, we normally expect it to be very well cared for. This would be data that's very structured. It's typically small. This is not a big data place. This is not a place where I have unstructured data. So that is relatively easy to move into the environment. But things like registry data, as we, we talked about over the last couple of hours, this can be very messy. There can be issues with the missingness of the data. So the quality issue is not the same across all data types. So each one of these carries its own expectations of, of the, uh, the velocity of the data as it moves into the system, as well as the quality of the data. And recognize that uh, newer data types, such as genomic data, imaging data, carries with it another whole set of expectations, as well as some pre-processing that has to be done before it's actually moved into the vault. The curation stage is done with a combination of both uh, hands-on data curators who are knowledgeable about the various data types, as well as um, sophisticated algorithms and heuristics that do some of the automated curation along the way. Again, the ingestion phase, putting it into the online data repository and putting it in a format in which standard can be applied so that it's usable to a much greater context, as well as being able to provide um, the mapping aliasing that is part of the expectation as we aggregate the data. And then finally, it's moved into a secure cloud interface so that it can be used by our quantitative medicine colleagues and other researchers, again, with high fidelity expectations. So this is part of the process that's behind the scenes to ensure that, again, quality is maintained and that you can expect to be able to rely on the data as it, as it evolves in time. Next slide. Now, uh, as I mentioned, there's, there's many customers who, who uh, have access to this data, again, assuming that they uh, have signed the uh, data use agreements, but uh, again, these are very varied in terms of their knowledge and expertise, as well as um, their use of the data. So uh, we like to be a full service provider in terms of providing this, recognizing the diversity of the customers. So we must be able to provide this in terms of um, different hierarchies of, of users, as, and it's really a, a tool to facilitate a diff, um, greater collaboration. So all that we're talking about in terms of, particularly in the rare disease space, being able to leverage the collective wisdom and, not, and expertise of our, of our uh, collective environment, this is a place that we hope we can do it. And again, with the security that's put in place here, this is not a place where, oh, you wanna be a Russian hacker? Come on in. It, it just doesn't happen. So. Uh, 
And of course, we have to be diligent in this regard because it's not something that uh, stays constant. So uh, we can't uh, be complacent in this regard. So security is a big aspect of this as well as the authenticity of the users. So that is something that's guaranteed as, as people move into the system. But we're still obviously very intent on being able to apply current regulations to ensure compliance so that when you're, when you're part of this environment, you should expect that, uh, again, this is done in a secure way. You have access to all of this as, as well as others. And it's, it's part of the, the shared community in a, an open science venue. Next slide. Now, an obvious question would be, well, how good is the data? How good does the data have to be? And, and clearly this is not a one size fits all approach. So we're, we're definitely looking at this and that's why the context of use agreement is so important because it sets the bar in terms of what the expectations on a particular data type is, as well as the tools that we may build from the data. And uh, the required uh, heuristics recognizing the different needs of the different users are, are built into the system. We like to do this in an automated way, but, but sometimes this revol uh, revolves around a very candid discussion on specific use cases. Now, obviously a big part of the difficulty is being able to integrate the various diverse data types into a coherent data structure. And that's also a place where we have data profiling, being able to take a look at the accuracy of the data and the completeness of the data. So these are things that can be done in an automated fashion but also require our, our data curation experts to, to be able to uh, really provide a lot of oversight and scrutiny of this. So simple logistics around dealing with inaccuracies. Again, I, I provide a very uh, simplistic overview. Am I gonna accept the error, reject the error, correct the error? So these are just common ways of automating some of this, but and sometimes uh, this is not so simple. So uh, we need to create either a developed value or more detailed heuristics around how we're going to handle data that falls outside of the expectation range. Next slide. So we would like to, again, uh, recognize that uh, privacy and security are, are really at the heart of what we're, what we're doing at the very beginning as we bring the data into our secure environment. Uh, this is obviously something where we recognize that the global standards are, are changing dynamically, so we have to pay attention to where the data resides, how it resides in compliance with global ideas around both security and privacy. So this is a little bit of a moving target, but something that uh, obviously CPATH is paying attention to and very diligent about. So the issue around security uh, is something that is built into the environment so that unauthorized users uh, really can't get easily uh, in this at all. So uh, it's something that uh, obviously we, we spend a lot of time thinking about, but also something that's going to change over time where we, we have to avoid complacently be, complacency because new security threats, as I'm sure we're all familiar with, are, are uh, ever present. So it's, uh, again, built into the CPATH Data Collaboration Center and, and something that we, uh, we, uh, we've managed with a lot of pride. Next slide. So in terms of stages of quality, this is, uh, again, we have this concept of providence. How can I ensure over time? That's why I was glad that the question came up because the, the time element is, is actually very critical here. So um, we would like to be able to use technology that uh, is able to capture this and, and run reports on uh, the consistency of the data over time and then take a look at the reproducibility of the, the drill downs over time to get a better assessment from, is this an occasion where we should take a look more candidly? At, so the, the question around sustainability was actually great because that is something that we need to pay attention to obviously as well because Models built from data sets that reflect the current standard of care don't stay that way forever. So it has to be revisited. You, if you're gonna be the caretaker of the tool, then you have to be able to look back and say, is it still relevant? Does it still provide the assurance that um, that, that baseline assessment or that active control is, is still what would be the regulatory standard? So this is a place where both the data and the tools are dynamic in time and need to be revisited. So. It is more than, than just a caretaker, it's somebody who has to be actively a part of the evolution of these tools over time. And the other part is if we're going to actually use this as part of a regulatory decision making, pharmaceutical sponsors or regulatory authorities want to be able to ensure the traceability. So compliance with 21 CFR part 11 
is something that uh, again we we strive to be in all cases, but uh, is also a, a moving target because, as I mentioned, things are changing dynamically over time with with the standard of care and with the appearance of new drugs on the marketplace. So all of these need to be considered in terms of both the integrity of the source data as well as the tools that they're built from. Likewise, the routine providence around privacy, study reporting, and publishing of medical research, if that represents one of the sources to pull in information, then that also needs the requisite security and data integrity checks as we ingest the data into the system as well. Some of the other modeling types that we're talking about in the future, AI and machine learning, where we're talking about really big data sources, potentially messy data, unstructured data, this is also a place where it's, it's not so easy to do this in a, in a hand curated manner. So it requires us to invest in technology that's evolving all the time and to be able to enforce standards as they also mature. So it, it's, it's definitely a snapshot in time. I wouldn't say that that quality is something that we, we turn the page on at any given time. It's, it's certainly a dynamic and it, it's something that uh, requires the whole community to invest in. Next slide. So this is really the last slide, and I, and I tried to provide this segue to this because, again, when, when CPATH brings data into the community, it's, it's not like this is a, uh, a garbage truck going down the street collecting data from all comers. There is an expectation that the data generator is also taking care of the data and that they can verify certain expectations around the quality of that data as we, now we will obviously spend a lot of time and effort ensuring that data standards are applied, but, um, you know, it reminds me when I was discussing um, the idea of um, recycling with my wife, she was convinced that, um, that there was a garbage truck just picking it all up and was putting it in the, same, in the same bin and they weren't really doing anything with it. So we had to actually walk down and see it in the truck being put into two separate bins. Well, the, the same is true of the data. So regardless of how it comes into the system, the standards that are need to be applied need to be applied differently for the different data types but also with the expectations of use. So, and it requires this community to invest in, in quality and the governance uh, of all aspects of this. So it, it's hard to be, you, you can't, one group can't be responsible for quality. It has to be the collective that really participates this in a bigger way. And the governance around setting principles and practices that ensure, ensure high quality has to be part of the ongoing dialogue. So I was delighted to accept being part of this discussion, but. This is something that requires, I think, a lot more discussion because as the data types evolve and as we get better in terms of creating data use agreements that allow us to share more rapidly and uh, more vigorously, this issue is something that we all need to invest in. So uh, that's all I had. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you, Jeff. So um, I will move on to um, the panelists and then we'll bring you in for, for the rest of the discussion. Uh, so, if we could go next to Lori Conklin from Revere, Jim. Hi, thank you, Jeff, for that presentation. That was wonderful. Um, I'm just going to speak um, somewhat to some some of your points. One is that, in speaking of data that is not clinical trial data, we speak of disease-specific registries, natural history studies, or sometimes quality improvement studies within um, a disease area, and these can be very um, robust sources of data, um, academics and foundations often look to these sources of data and want that data to be used to facilitate drug development. But we know that because of the data standards, sometimes these um, types of studies are not useful for regulatory submissions and labels. So how can they be made regulatory friendly? Um, we think they can with work and a commitment to collaboration. Um, we've spoken a bit about the need to involve all stakeholders early in the planning of registries and the need to involve regulators early. And I'm not sure that some academics or foundations are, are, are knowledgeable or aware that all of these people need to come to the table early on in order to optimize um, uh, these studies. And these comments come from a, my, my perspective as a past FDA reviewer. Um, I was also a physician enrolling in a QI study um, and I work on a small biotech company now. Next slide, please. I thought a bit about what types of innovations could help to improve um, data from these types of studies. 
And uh, an, over, an overlying theme, which has also been mentioned, is how we've needed to pivot during this COVID time in order to um, generate regulatory compliant data despite the challenges that we're facing. So in some companies have decided to halt trials and others have needed to move forward and um, with remote assessments. And so challenges cited by regulators include variable timing of efficacy assessment and safety ass assessments. Um, and these could be done remotely with remote visits, patient portals, electronic reminders and prompts. There are um, tools there. Um, other things like missing data, broad enrollment criteria, variable dosing regimens, and concomitant medications. That one speaks to the changing nature of treatment of disease um, that has been mentioned as well, that data in a QA study, um, as the, the standard of care shifts, um, so will the, the data in that registry. Variable disease definitions, uh, lack of data prominence and integrity, one of the issues here is data monitoring and something that many companies have had to turn to during this uh, pandemic time is, is SOP, developing SOPs for remote monitoring and working with sites in order to do remote monitoring. One of the problems with data quality from some of these studies is likely cost. And you know there are um, uh, studies that are NIH funded have adequate funding, but there may be other very small um, disease communities that are trying to start a registry um, and they don't necessarily have the same level of funding. And so remote visits, remote monitoring can help to improve the quality of data um, without uh, expanding the cost um, enormously. And then key assessments needed that are sometimes not done as part of routine clinical care, but are necessary for specific drug development programs. And these could be done with a well-designed prospective study nested within the infrastructure of a registry, natural history or QI study. I wanted to, and so I, in summary, the innovation really um, should drive, uh, should be driving this. Um, I just wanted to drop one more line in because um, I haven't heard it discussed yet, which is return of data back to participants. And so we've developed a version of process for um, after the trial is finished, um, returning data back to participants. And that's been a request from many of the patient groups in the Duchenne community. I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, so before we uh, move on to Sam Hume from CDISC, I just wanted to send to give everybody a reminder to please send along questions either through the Q&A or by email to rd.data um, at duke.edu so that we can uh, engage in a robust uh, discussion with uh, those that are viewing us um, online and are not part of the um, panel um, session. Uh, so, um, and with that, can I um, turn over the mic to Sam? Sounds good, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about CDISC. We're a global nonprofit standards development organization. And as I'm sure most of you know, um, we are, or certain of our standards are required for regulatory data submissions to agencies like the FDA and globally to agencies like the PMDA in Japan. And so I kind of want to take a couple of minutes and highlight the value of standards in terms of uh, data quality and, and aggregating data, which we know is important uh, in rare disease areas. And this particular slide, one of the uh, important takeaways is the notion that, at least the way I think of standards, is more as a pipeline of standards. So yeah, we have collection standards that are critical to collecting high quality data and ensuring that from the start we're, we're using standards, but it's also important to realize that we've got standards at each step along the way of the, the, the pipeline so, such that if we follow standards when we collect the data, and then it makes it quite a bit easier to generate these standardized raw data sets, SDTM data sets. And we can do that with basically a minimum number of transformations and the transformations that do exist really don't have an adverse effect on data quality. We know if, if we've collected data from lots of different sources and we start to try to create standardized data sets that the types of transformations that are needed, for example, you have a study that has 
uh, potentially uh, three levels of adverse event severity, another one used five. Uh, when you go to map those into a common uh, data set, you know there's going to be some uh, transformations that are going to impact quality, they're going to impact traceability, they're going to take time and money to conduct and maintain. So the idea of standards throughout the pipeline, I think, has a lot of value and helps us to ensure that uh, the analysis results and the analysis data sets that we're looking at, yeah, they're of high quality and we can trace that back to the way that the data was collected. Um, the data collection standards, it all starts from the beginning. If you don't collect them uh, in a, according to the standards, again, it makes additional work, um, additional transformations that can have a uh, negative effect on data quality, not to mention complicating things and taking more time and effort to generate. So the idea is, yeah, we collect them. And it's not just clinical data elements. These data elements exist in a, in a context. So they exist in a domain, which didn't exist in a class to ensure that the content that you're collecting um, will support generating the types of raw standardized data sets like SDTM data sets, as well as supporting the types of analysis that you wanna do um, at the end of the study. So I think data standards play a, a, certainly a, a critical role in helping to enforce standardization. In fact, um, as you are probably aware for submissions uh, and just generally for exchanging data, folks, we have, we have conformance rules that can help to test the quality of the, the data sets. And uh, of course, this just gives us another, uh, another measurement uh, that helps to indicate the quality of the data that we're working with. At the bottom of the slide, then, I included um, a couple of examples of therapeutic area user guides for rare diseases. And these are ones we worked on with CPATH. Um, we've got a lot of uh, therapeutic area user guides we've developed, um, many with the FDA. These particular ones, Huntington's disease and Duchenne muscular dystrophy, again, working with CPATH, targeting rare diseases. And you, you could think of... Um, therapeutic area user guides as really more or less a configuration of the CETA standards for application in a specific disease area. So it covers a lot of the metadata, the controlled terminology, the, um, the examples and information that's needed really to ensure that within that disease area, you're consistently applying the standards. So the goal then is that, yeah, we're gonna collect them consistently. We're gonna use controlled terminology consistently throughout the process, but we're gonna get these standardized raw data sets, these SDTM data sets, now that are much easier to make and much more consistent, and it makes it much easier to pool and aggregate the data, which of course is uh, one of the things that we're looking for um, in support of rare diseases to be able to take uh, you know, smaller studies essentially and start to pool and aggregate data. And um, I'll say that uh, the therapeutic area user guides have helped with that. We've seen that, again, this isn't just hypothetical for um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, for example. We've seen evidence that you've been able to pool data, and that's true across uh, a large number of disease areas. And in fact, I'll, I'll say that in cases where folks are implementing the standards outside of regulated research, um, one of the key drivers is this ability to create standardized, consistent data sets that are much easier to pull and aggreg aggregate and that people, because the standards are published, they have a decent understanding of what they're looking at and working with. And I'll, I'll close there. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Sam. So if we could now turn to Ron Bartek. Thanks, Ron. Thank you, Marta, and thank you too uh, to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this uh, excellent panel. I'd like to describe very briefly what one patient advocacy organization, the one I work with, the Friedrichs Ataxi Research Alliance, or FARA, has already done and is continuing to do to collect and share quality data in at least two of the types of data sets Jeff and Laurie highlighted and Tina Erb emphasized in, in the first session. Uh, those two types of data sets are patient registry data and natural history data. First, in regards to the patient registry data, I will be brief here because our patient registry data involves very limited sharing for reasons that will become clear. Um, in our patient registry, all the data are patient or patient family entered. It is a global database that is both HIPAA and GDPR compliant. It is a contact registry with primarily dem demographic data, 
but it does include information such as genetic confirmation of disease, medications the patient is taking, uh, and stage of symptom progression, for example. So it's extremely helpful in informing patients of opportunities to participate in clinical trials and other research for which they are most likely to be eligible and that uh, are in close proximity to them. It's enabled us, uh, for example, to recruit clinical trials within just a couple of hours with very few screen failures or dropouts. Uh, so our pharma partners who are preparing to sponsor a clinical trial work with us well in advance in developing their protocols, including clinical uh, site selection and inclusion exclusion criteria designed to optimize selection of subjects. When the sponsor notifies FARA that it's ready to launch the trial, FARA then notifies those patients in the registry who appear to be eligible, informs them of the opportunity, provides them with the inclusion and exclusion criteria and some key points of the protocol, along with the contact information uh, for the participating clinical site nearest them, leaving the decision, of course, to participate or not completely up to them. Uh, FARA does not provide the registry itself to the trial sponsor or the clinical sites. It's FARA that communicates with the patients. The patients then decide if they want to participate, and if so, they contact the sites themselves. There are occasions on which uh, FARA will provide a sponsor aggregated data from the patient registry. For example, when planning a trial, we can inform the sponsor as to how many patients in the registry appear to meet the inclusion and exclusion criteria being considered. Next, a quick look at our natural history data. Um, first, regarding data quality. Uh, we began our natural history study almost 20 years ago, but not actually as a natural history study. Rather, we, we were eager to begin our first clinical trials. So we assembled 10 clinician scientists with our ND, NINDS program officer and concluded quickly that we could not begin such trials without scales to measure success or failure. So we assembled at the NIH a dozen patients along with those clinician scientists who, who then examined and tested each patient with a neurological exam and a battery of other tests borrowed from other disorders. Those same clinician scientists examined the same patients 18 months later and analyzed the data as to the sensitivity of those measures to change uh, over time without intervention. We also worked with our dear colleague, Petra Kaufman, who was at that time the clinical trials office director at NINDS, and who spoke with, with us obviously earlier this afternoon. And, and her very important program to develop common data elements across multiple diseases, including ours. Uh, we then selected and supported five clinical sites to see patients using the same exams and tests identified in that exercise at the NIH. We worked with volunteers from an IT company to develop the digital templates, including those uh, common data elements, needed to uh, report the clinician entered data in a standardized format to the dedicated servers at, that we had placed at the central uh, clinical site. Those data were soon recognized, as you can imagine, as natural history rather than just for scales development. Uh, and the number of our sites participating in that study has grown to, uh, from five to a dozen sites uh, that have now formed our collaborative uh, clinical research network in Friedrich's Ataxia, where we conduct the vast majority of our clinical trials. Now regarding data quality, protection, and management in that natural history study. Uh, we then met with uh, the team at the University of Rochester that was operating both the Huntington's and Parkinson's study groups and agreed to transfer our data to their platform and contract, contract with them for entering all our natural history data on that platform and for having them protect, manage, and help analyze those data. This increasingly robust natural history database and publications derived from it have been effective in, in characterizing our disease for, and providing the basis for development of such things as clinical outcome measures and biomarkers, as well as uh, obviously in clinical trial design. Also, we continue to add to this database the results of additional exams de determined to be important over time, such as for hearing, neuroimaging, and the placebo arm data from clinical trials. 
Finally, regarding quality protection management and sharing, FARA has established a governance committee and initially it was willing to share with our natural, uh, from our natural history database, only aggregated data analyses and, re and resulting publications. Recently, however, uh, the governance committee under strict compliance with protection and privacy requirements has begun to share some data with applicants whose needs, capacities, and commitment clearly justify that sharing. FARA also entered into a full active collaboration with the Critical Path Institute NORD program that Jeff outlined, uh, as did Katie Donahue and Vanessa Bullinger uh, earlier. Um, that is the, the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator dot data and analytics platform. And our dear, um, where we're collaborating fully with our dear colleague and friend, Jane Larkindale. We have submitted our natural history data set fully to this program and they've mapped it to um, the, the CDISC standards that Sam just explained and will continue to update uh, the RDCA DAP Friedrichs Ataxi database and to provide additional data sets as they become available. Already placebo arm data from our four uh, pharma sponsored trials have been added and we look forward to adding data from a pediatric natural history study we've initiated as well as a neuroimaging study as soon as those two studies are completed. We also look very much forward to additional analyses from collaborations with FARA statisticians and RDCA DAP analysts regarding important aspects such as refinement of our clinical outcome measures and a far better understanding of the placebo effect and how to predict account and adjust for it. And of course, we are hopeful that sharing our, our RDCA DAP data and analysis of those data with our other disease groups will be beneficial to those other diseases and to us. So thank you very much. Th thank you so much, Ron. And I will now turn it over to um, Shurjo. Hi, uh, good afternoon. I wanna thank the Duke Margolis team for the invitation to participate in this panel. Um, as mentioned, my name is Shrujal Boxy. I'm a medical oncologist and I currently serve as a senior medical director at Flatiron Health. For those who may not know us, we are a software and services company operating in the oncology or cancer sector. We provide electronic health records or EHRs and practice management software to cancer clinics across the United States. And we develop carefully curated, de-identified real world data sets that can be used to generate insights and answer a broad range of research questions in oncology. So I wanna start by acknowledging that my perspective might sound a little different than others on the panel, given the source of data and the biology of cancer and the rapid progress and increasing precision of the newly studied therapies in this space. High quality longitudinal real world data can provide useful insights in oncology for rare tumor types that aren't represented in clinical trials and have been a challenge for drug development. An early example of where real world data was able to provide evidence to support regulatory approval for a drug in a rare population is the supplemental approval, approval for palvocyclic, a CD4-6 inhibitor for male patients with breast cancer. We're learning more sort of over time about how and when real world data can be used for regulatory decision making and how to ensure that real world data is truly fit for purpose. While observational data has always been part of hypothesis generation and will continue to play an important role in that space, its use in regulatory decision making requires us to systematically address the many issues highlighted by Dr. Barrett at the start of this panel. We recognize the utility of prospective pre-specified data generation, but there is value in retrospective data, such as that available from an EHR, like in the Flatiron database, where data is generated as part of routine care and then later processed using technology to answer very specific research questions. This provides a nimble approach to data generation as our research questions and our understanding of diseases truly do evolve over time. In oncology specifically, as we learn more about the molecular underpinnings and drivers of cancer, such as biomarker defined subsets, the list of relatively rare subpopulations of cancers are only increasing. Take for example, non-small cell lung cancer, once considered a single entity treated with the blunt instrument known as cytotoxic chemotherapy, 
we have now identified over 15 subtypes of biomarker-defined non-small cell lung cancer, many with unique precision treatment options. The rapid uptake of genomic tumor profiling provides this opportunity to use real-world data to study how treatments perform in these rare and emerging cancer populations. However, I wanted to highlight today in this panel some specific considerations for evidence generation for rare cancers or really rare diseases when using data sources like an EHR that are distinct from some of the considerations relevant as we develop disease registries. Specifically, we need to optimize how to identify the patients of interest from the broader cohort. At Flatiron, we're exploring the use of machine learning given the critical role it plays in our ability to identify and glean insights for rare patient populations, often measured in hundreds of patients that are captured in our larger EHR database, which includes over 2 million cancer patients. There is a unique opportunity here for regulators to bring together the data community to really explore the possibilities for machine learning to automate and make the challenges for studying rare cancer cohorts or even other diseases using EHR type databases more responsible and in a scientifically rigorous way. Another challenge for studying rare cancer cohorts is the need often for deep data models to confidently answer complex regulatory questions using retrospective data. In certain situations, it actually requires us to link EHR data to other data sources, such as claims or structured genomic data. In a robust healthcare data ecosystem, key information would be accessible and linked across disparate sources. And we discussed this a little bit in the former panel, but that would facilitate sharing of databases and providing more holistic patient journey information in a safe and protected way. The third consideration I wanted to highlight for discussion today is that in the rarest of diseases or cancer types, and I, you know, I refer back to the conversation around C-DISC, it's going to be difficult to identify enough patients from any single data source to conduct robust analyses. There is an opportunity here to partner with different data vendors, regulators, um, organizations like C-DISC in the development of guidelines to standardize quality metrics for observational data generation and reporting, a consistent ontology for common data variables, and then the considerations around processing of unstructured data with the transparency into data provenance and ultimately create robust data sets that are consistent with what was discussed in the CPATH conversation. This is going to all be necessary for sharing data from complementary data sources such as EHRs. We believe it is likely that the more we have regulatory certainty around these types of issues and how data is used in rare cohorts, the more investment we're likely to see in the innovative solutions to these problems and the healthcare data infrastructure as technology continues to evolve. Um, Shrujal, thank you so much. And uh, if I can turn things over now to Maria. Okay, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, uh, so good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to be on this panel. So my name is Matilda Cam. I am the Associate Director for Analytics and Informatics of the Office of Biostatistics at CEDAR. So I, I think that it is a good idea to, uh, to regularly have this type of interactions uh, among the various stakeholders where we can learn uh, from each other. So the knowledge we gain would help facilitate the development of good quality programs that are likely to support regulatory submissions. Uh, on the one hand, we can learn more about the difficulties that you are having in rare disease drug development, and you can learn about what information we at the agency need to make good regulatory decisions. So as we've heard from the previous speakers and panelists, uh, there are unique challenges that hinder us from conducting efficient and effective clinical trials in rare disease, you know, such as small patient numbers, limited understanding of the disease, uh, variability of disease presentation, and lack of validated endpoints. 
We also heard that data sharing is essential in rare disease since it enables researchers to uh, test the validity of their research findings, strengthening analysis through combined data sets. Uh, there, we could reuse hard to generate data and as well as support the development of diagnostics and therapies. So now I'd like to provide some regulatory considerations from a statistical perspective on shared data resources in rare disease. But before we talk about how to share data, I think we should first get uh, the lay of the land and understand what's out there what data has been collected, uh, you know, what is the quality of those data, what is missing from the data, are the data good enough to support regulatory submission. So this exercise will help us in planning for future research studies so that uh, the needed data will be collected uh, that could support regulatory submissions. So now in, in terms of natural history data, uh, there should be a comprehensive characterization of the natural history of a given rare disease uh, that is targeted for uh, clinical development. I know that when researchers are starting out in designing their studies er, you know, early on, their focus is more on uh, just the specific research project or questions that they are trying to answer. However, it would be great if right from the start of your research project, you could prospectively design your data collection, uh, taking into account the possibility that your research data might serve as a potential comparator in a clinical trial. So your data could provide information on the natural history of a disease in the absence of an intervention and then help design future clinical trials. So by beginning your research with the end in mind, you'd be able to collect the needed information prospectively. So another issue that I could see is we should also consider the, the impact of the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, on the potential use of the natural history data. Patients with rare diseases have a higher risk of being identifiable despite data anonymization. I'd also like to emphasize that we need high quality data uh, to make good regulatory decisions. This means we need to know the data provenance, that is the documentation of where a piece of data comes from and the processes and methodology by which it was produced needs to be provided with this, the NDA BLA submission. Uh, if there are missing data, we would also like to know where and also why the data are missing. Uh, another is uh, typically uh, COAs or clinical outcomes assessments such as PROs or clinician reported outcomes are used as measures of clinical benefit in clinical trials. So all data collected using COAs should be submitted. So this means that even if, for example, your endpoint is the total score uh, for a given COA, uh, so this are, COAs are also referred to as questionnaires, ratings, and scales, or QRS in CDISC lingo. Uh, we would still need the individual item responses from the COA that comprise the total score, uh, and they, sh they, are needed, uh, they need to be included in uh, submissions data sets. So we need all the data to be able to really investigate whether your drug is efficacious or safe. And, has, and as has been mentioned, having and using data standards in shared data resources are important for clinical trial readiness end-to-end, -end, as uh, Sam has talked about. Uh, and uh, it's also needed for regulatory submissions. So data standards supports data sharing and data inter interoperability. Uh, and lastly, uh, the key to streamlining the approval process, I think, is by establishing close collaboration and communication uh, among the different stakeholders, you know, the researchers, the sponsors, the regulatory agencies, to address both met methodological and statistical challenges during clinical development. So, thank you.
Uh, thank you so much, Maria. So uh, we will now have a chance to uh, to uh, engage in a broader discussion. So if I could ask all the session three panelists to come on video. Um, thanks. And uh, what I wanted to do um, first is we have a couple of questions uh, coming in. Um, uh, through the chat, uh, but uh, so, and I encourage others to post more questions. The question that I wanted to um, to ask, I mean, uh, so Jeff started us off, you know, um, CPATH has, has a very strong connection with the FDA and, and he spoke about uh, regulatory science and then Sam later um, uh, touched uh, briefly on sort of some of the uh, global considerations and then most recently uh, Maria also mentioned uh, you know some of the privacy sort of regulations and whatnot so I wanted to ask about sort of the data standardization and sort of the requirements from different regulatory agencies and uh, what uh, how does one operationalize given that presumably there isn't complete and full harmonization in terms of what the different regulatory um, uh, bodies require. Uh, rare diseases definitely don't respect borders, but uh, regulatory agencies probably do. So I would love to open it up for discussion about how does one think about operationalizing all of this and have quality data and have data standards uh, when we're faced with uh, this uh, setting where we do have regulatory bodies that might um, require somewhat different um, uh, have somewhat different requirements. So I'm, I'm, I, I don't have a specific person that I wanted to call on, but, but Jeff, you're actually off, off mute. So I don't know if you have any. Uh, <laughs> okay. I guess I'm an easy target. No, I, this, this has come up uh, in uh, many situations, even in my past lives uh, where, you know, I, I think it's, it's uh, something that has to be discussed upfront. And I would say from the standpoint of a pharmaceutical sponsor, I mean, I, I think you're always going to have to customize uh, it, whether it's a submission, the, the data aspect of it or, or the analysis to individual regulatory authorities. So I, I think we, we love to have harmonization when we can, but uh, that's not always the case as you, you just brought up. And I could tell you from my past life at the Gates Foundation, this was, this was certainly an issue this is something that required a lot of discussion when we were doing work with IMI in particular. Um, it came up, but we customized data use agreements that were specific to that organization and, and tried to harmonize ourselves. So it was always a negotiation, but I, I wouldn't say that we always made it easy on ourselves. So in, in many cases, we would have to customize what we're doing for a particular regulatory authority. Others uh, could chime into the discussion, Ron? Yeah, I'll just add from the patient advocacy perspective that initially when we uh, started our, what became our natural history database, we were uh, almost entirely US centered. And um, so we were most conscious of the HIPAA requirements and uh, complied fully with those. Then uh, as we were developing a global patient registry, which is what we have now, we are very conscientious about going to the European Union and to patient advocacy organizations in Europe to make sure that that new global um, patient, or natural history database and patient registry were both um, completely com GDPR compliant. And our, our learning there was if you're GDPR compliant, you are definitely compliant with, with other regulatory requirements elsewhere. So. Hi, this is Tina. I have a quick question or comment to that, Ron. How are you? Um, so ev everyone's very concerned with GDPR, but we also work with other countries that uh, have other regulatory systems, uh, Japan, for instance, and how things dovetail with all of that. So it's, just, it, it's a bigger picture, I think, sometimes. And speaking of Japan, I mean, if thinking about um, alignment across uh, regulatory agencies from a standards perspective, um, the good news is largely they are consistent. So, I mean, if looking at it from a glass half full perspective, um, the, the implementation of the standards by the regulatory authorities are very, and for the most part, uh, similar. Now, it doesn't 
it's not to say there aren't some differences and that the differences aren't a point of frustration. Um, but um, for example, you'll find if you look at the conformance rules for a submission to the FDA versus a submission to the PMDA, yeah, there, there's some differences there that you need to be aware of and need to account for, but largely things are aligned. And I will say there is, um, um, to my knowledge, an ongoing dialogue to, to talk about what the standards should look like and to make sure they can kind of maximize the points of agreement and ensure they kind of minimize those areas where they see that um, there are kind of agree to disagree on um, what they expect or need from the standards. Yeah, this is Teresa. Can I just chime in on that a little bit? Um, so I think that, at, for example, with ICH, uh, the International uh, Council on Harmonization of Regulatory Standards, we have as an operating rule that we're trying to work within the statutory parameters that we're given. I mean, so 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 for example, the privacy, you know, patient data privacy uh, and security protections come are, are just a given. For us, and, and we, you know, we're going to work within that. Different uh, regulators have different requirements for what's submitted. FDA requires all the data to be submitted, as Matilda was saying. Uh, you know, that's not required in by EMA. They don't require all the data. Some member states are thinking that might be helpful, but that's not a current requirement. I think, in fact, we might be one of the few regulators who currently require all the data. And and so we're really looking at and analyzing and using it all. Uh, I don't really hear from our EMA or PMDA colleagues an idea that they would go off and use a different standard. I mean, to Sam's point, I think that these are the CDISC and um, the uh, FIRE standard for interoperability and submissions. I mean, they're basic standards that are used in the CTD is an ICH, um, you know, the uh, common technical document is an ICH uh, generated document. And of course, MEDRA is a standard for submitting, uh, you know, kind of adverse event data. So, so I think that, uh, you know, there's a pretty good uh, kind of uh, set of things there. And uh, uh, so we're not, uh, you know, we still do things differently, but it's not as bad as you, you know, one might think it could be. Thanks, Teresa. And, and Shrujar, did you want to chime in as well? I was going to just share sort of our experience, which is a little bit different. Our data is generated in the routine care of patients, and we're actually going back to the EHR to create the, the research side of that data, right? And what's been interesting and evolving is as we think about taking research data and now creating regulatory data, this question around harmonizing to data standards really becomes paramount because you have to you have to present data in a way that's understandable and analyzable and comparable to data that's been seen previously. And so what I was going to ask Sam sort of as a back of this is it's one thing to set forth a data model and then go forward and collect it. But what we're ultimately doing is we're trying to take data that's generated as it is in routine care and then try to fit it into models that were sort of pre-specified. I don't know if that is a question or a comment or just waiting for a reaction, but it, I think that that science really of harmonization of data is actually something that's gonna evolve as we have new emerging data sources available to answer these really hard questions, especially in rare populations. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, a, one trend we see is kind of the um, lessening of the influence of the kind of the case report form and traditional data collection instruments and an increase in this a wide variety of different uh, data sources. And in many cases, if they're new and novel, yeah, maybe the standards aren't as fully developed or the sources aren't as fully aware of what standards are out there. And those tend to be the pain points because they're less less mature. Um, it's also true that um, we're uh, working closely and, and I actually have just completed a draft of mappings, for example, to fire because we realize that, hey, that's a really uh, important source of data going forward and that we're working with OMOP and other sources to try to ensure there's alignment as much as possible to support real world data and support real world evidence where we can. Um, and we know it's evolving so that over time things are going to change and we need to Put ourselves in a position to be able to um, adapt to the the way the science changes. Um, but oh, this, was, I, this is Eileen King. I want to jump in here and build on on what you just said. So, so 
in the research world, the, the, the desire is to extract data from the electronic medical record to populate the clinical databases. So this builds exactly on what you had just said. Is there plans that the CBIS standards, and, and, and my understanding is that it's the fire standards that they just the fire standards that may become the standards for electronic medical records, although I'm not sure that's totally true. But um, is there any plans to modify CBIS standards to meet, say, fire standards if those become more common? Yeah, um, so we just publish for internal review a set of mappings essentially. So how we, you know, I mentioned it, you know, the standards is a pipeline. And um, what we want to be able to do is pull in EHR data based on fire. And so we've kind of set that up now and we've run some, done some work with the FDA and others to pilot mechanisms for moving data out of EHRs into CDIS data sets. And so we've got some, some papers and some other things written that describe uh, that, that work. So yeah, that's something we're actively in, engaged in. And I'm sure um, right now it's very early days in terms of um, it's much more interest in doing this with fire than it is actual sites um, uh, making this happen. And I, I think over time, as the if the pendulum does start to shift where more and more of this data is collected directly from an EHR, then yeah, it'll, it'll certainly influence the way the standards look. Um, so, Teresa. Marta, yeah, I have a question. So I have a question for the folks on the panel too. Um, and that's to go back to something Sam was talking about earlier, which is, you know, um, that we, that there's work to do and there, I mean, you, you need to have terms defined the same way. I mean, if it's collected, it's, it doesn't help to come in on the back end if things have been defined differently and, and measured differently by different, you know, uh, clinicians collecting information or different researchers collecting information. And one of the things I think that you've done, uh, C, um, CDISC and CPATH have, I think, worked on it with others, you know, um, is the, the therapeutic area, uh, the TOG, I forget what that, uh, now I'm forgetting what the acronym stands for, but it's this therapeutic area user or something, something. Guide. And it's basically the terminology specific to a disease like Huntington's or, um, you know, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. There's some clinical terminology. There are some, uh, maybe it's um, endpoints that are, are going to be, um, that you need to all be using the same definition and the same ways of defining terms from the, uh, on the, uh, from the front end to make sure that what you've got is then really understood and anable, analyzable at the back end. And I don't think we've really gotten away from the need for that, have we? I mean, it, isn't that still some, uh, kind of foundational work that's needed, or am I just like being too old school here? Maybe there are other ways one can do this. I would say absolutely. And just to, to build on um, work that we're doing to help make that a reality is we've also recently published some link code mapping. So as we realize as we're, we're collecting more and more real world data and more folks want alignment with routine healthcare, that uh, that those mappings are important. So we're we're trying to do more and more of that. To, so to your point, to we, that we do use a common vocabulary everywhere we can, and maybe over time those vocabularies will will shift. But for now, um, it's it's critical that we that we standardize on that because it makes a huge difference in our ability to pool the data, aggregate the data without having to translate everything. And in the translation, information is lost. Again, just just to add, I mean, I think. As we're hosting uh, data of, uh, for different therapeutic areas, it's of tremendous value to have the CDIS standards already in place within each of these therapeutic areas. So, and most of the sponsors who contribute to that data automatically do this. So this is not something typically that uh, CPAT has to do on their own, particularly data that comes from pharmaceutical sponsors. The issue comes typically when it's, it's not from a, a sponsor and then we would have to retrospectively apply standards to that kind of data set, which still can be done, but it's it's more tedious and requires more effort. But uh, we definitely are using CDISC as the backbone of the, the data set that we evolve for regulatory purposes. So if, if I can sort of uh, stay on, on, on this topic, uh, you know, what, what, um, what tools do we have other than CDISC uh, standards to ensure data interoperability? 
because data and interoperability is broader than just um, uh, you know uh, the, the standards. So what, what else do we have? Sure, Gerald, you actually spoke a little bit. You touched on it a little bit earlier, um, but I uh, I don't know if you have any further comments. Um, you know, we, we we actually think about this a fair amount. Um, I think that when I look at it through the regulatory lens and what I'm hearing from Maria um, is the more we have to transform the data, the, and I think Jeff just said the same thing, you sort of have to explain every step and provide transparency into every step so that all of it is auditable and you can go back and understand how that data transformed from where you started to where you ended. And I know that as a, a company that creates an EHR, there is sort of an increasing interest in capturing data at point of care in the format within which you might want to potentially use it for a research question. And within oncology, there's sort of been this move um, to help bring some of those specifics re really to the point of care so that the data that's generated in the delivery of you know, routine um, patient care, you're actually then able to use it without having to transform it, which is currently what we do. Um, I was, you know, I didn't really talk about this during my, my little five minute spiel, but, you know, we think about data really in two formats. One is the structured data and the other is the unstructured data. And really we're sort of caught in a world in medicine, at least where so much of the richness of what we want to know is still embedded within like physician notes or pathology reports. And um, we do a lot, whether we're doing it in a registry or we're doing it from EHR data, we're really sort of left with the same thing, which is applying a bunch of rules to translate that unstructured data into this meaningful sort of end use um, product. And you know, we try to follow all those rules to be kosher and, and have provenance. But again, it's applying something on top of the data at the time of creation for the unstructured, which is so different than the data that's sort of generated in a structured format because harmonizing that is just clean. There's no rules that you apply to the definition of a liver enzyme. It is what it is. It's just different labs and you have to make it all make sense. Um, our definition of advanced disease and the next data vendor's definition of advanced disease may differ substantially. And then how do we share that data with each other and then make sense of it? That to me, for, especially for these rare cohorts, will become something we're gonna to have to solve broadly. And sort of guidance um, and, and sort of re regulatory oversight on how we might start to do that, I think is gonna be very powerful across all these diseases as we start to merge data sets in order to have these analytic cohorts. So I think that's one component. The other component I think you might be hinting at is this idea of that global user ID or some kind of identifier so that we can start to identify across these rare cohorts, are we duplicating patients? Or can we actually combine the information from different data sets to get a broader sense of the entire trajectory of disease because people don't stay in one place or in one service network. Registries are powerful in the sense that patients will stay connected and follow no matter where they move or where they go. But for an EHR vendor, we only have the data for when that patient is within our system. They might go to Florida for the winters and then come back and there's just gaps in our visibility into what's happening. Um, and so I, I, you know, all of these topics that we're talking about today are incredibly relevant in the type of work that we're doing. And it's interesting to hear sort of how others are trying to solve those big problems. Uh, yes, Ron, go ahead. Uh, could I ask a question following on that, that wonderful exchange that the two of you have Absolutely, just and very, I very much actually encourage the participants to be asking questions, um, yeah. both panelists and also those who are viewing us on, online. I'm intrigued about the potential as we proceed to use CDISC and other controls on the quality and standardization of the data from various diseases that in some cases, in many cases, share symptomology. And, and um, if, if you look at the potential for developing um, across those disease lines, uh, clinical outcome measures uh, that are reporting on uh, improvements in clinical trials that are maybe incremental in nature. And how, if, if we can do that successfully, take a look at one of the, the common neurological symptoms, if you will, 
uh, in which uh, our disease name is included, Friedrich, Friedrich's ataxia. Ataxia is a, a general neurological um, imbalance or lack of coordination across Huntington's, Parkinson's, all, all the, the, the dominant and, and uh, recessive ataxias and many more. If, if we could show in, in uh, a series of clinical trials that the incremental movement of, uh, against those scales um, uh, that were based on common data uh, were um, uh, predictive, reasonably predictive of, of uh, clinical benefit, even though they were just a couple or three or four points on that particular scale. Look at what just happened in Parkinson's or look at what just happened in Huntington's with that same measure, whether it's a 25 foot time walk, a six minute walk test, um, pegboard tests that are common to several dis neurological disorders. Look, look what that led to two years down the line with that same therapeutic approach. It led to clinical, it demonstrated clinical benefit. Couldn't that help inform uh, people at the agency um, about the, um, the promise uh, that, that those measures, even though they seem to be incremental and symptomatic in nature in that one clinical trial, in that one disease, uh, have been demonstrated in other diseases to uh, be reasonably predictive of clinical benefit. So. Others have uh, thoughts on this topic? Eileen? Um, so this is Eileen. Oh, um, just, just a comment, and, and going back to what Tina Irv said this morning and a little foreshadowing of what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, the flavor of what you're talking about is exactly what we're trying to do in RD Syrian. We are studying um, 20, you know, we have 20 current consortia each study in three, at least three rare diseases. And we are working very hard in, to try to standardize data so that the data can be shared across the diseases. And what we're finding is that though the diseases are rare, the, the measures that they're using in those diseases are not rare, like you say. It's the same instrument that's been used. They're do, using the same neurodevelopmental tests, or they're using, you know, the same imaging and and our goal is to have these researchers collaborate as tina said they've been working in silos and we want them to collaborate how can i share the data from this disease to help me understand my disease and that's a big lift but that is that's our vision going forward that's exactly what we're trying to do and then working obviously with industry and fda um, on getting new treatments to to try to patient. Uh, Ron, you are on mute. Thank you very much, Eileen. That, that's exactly what I was looking for. And you know, your point goes to um, you know learning about my disease from the experience with a clinical outcome measure in another disease. I take it one step further. What can I learn as a pharmaceutical partner about my therapeutic uh, and, and, and my disease? because it, that, uh, that same marker was moved at the same level in a different disease and then led to clinical benefit. So I think if we can combine those two aspects uh, of this, these common data sets, wow, we've, we've made tremendous progress for all rare diseases. I agree. Jeff, did you wanna chime in? I didn't have anything to add, I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right, because <laughs> you went off mute, so I thought. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> so, um, and any other thoughts on, 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 on this topic? And also would love to um, invite uh, those who are listening into the conversation and, uh, and, uh, and also other panelists to, to speak in. Uh, Jane, go ahead. I feel like I'm speaking a lot here, but um, this is a really important topic that we've certainly been thinking about with respect to the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator data and analytics platform. 
is really the ability to search across diseases and understand biomarkers or, or outcome measures and how they relate across diseases, particularly the ultra rare diseases where there may not be enough data to really interpret or analyze within one disease state. We're not there yet, we haven't got enough data yet, but we're really looking at how to standardize and, and tag the data coming into our platform so you can search it in all these different ways all at once and really try and drive understanding across diseases as well as within each individual disease. And we want to help any way we can, Miss Jane. <laughs> and you know you are. <laughs> so, you know, so um, for folks uh, with experience as both a consumer and a provider of shared data, what steps do we need to take to ensure that we are collecting regulatory grade data if our ultimate goal is to use um, shared data to support drug development? I think that uh, having, so the CDISC standards are critically important, but then um, bringing the data in, um, we need to make sure that people are following data standards so that the data is meaningful and that we don't have wasted data. So perhaps it's an education component um, for people to understand um, how the data needs to be collected and monitored such that we have the highest quality data and it can be useful. Which actually is sort of a, a, a point to ask. I mean, you know, Shruja, you were saying uh, earlier uh, how much uh, work has to go in and how much uh, trail uh, has to be generated when you process the data, right? Uh, and so the earlier you set it up in the right way, the less you have to transform the data, which kind of goes back to what, Laurie, what you just said. How do you do it on the front end so you don't have to do it within the sort of this data infrastructure piece? What could we be done on, 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 on that end? Hi, Marta, this is Tina. Really quickly, I'm going to say one of the, the biggest challenges we have is to start getting people to do it early because they don't think it's important to do early. And I think it's a real mindset that whatever you're doing in the rare disease arena, you should really be doing with good data standards, using good data practices, because you never know what you're developing that you may need down the road. But I really think is educating investigators to, to start working early and to set, set good data practices early in the process. Can the panelists offer some, some ways through which this could be done, uh, examples of where that has been done successfully or potential paths um, in that uh, space of how to get that really early engagement? So I'll put on my academic hat, which is what I wore before I joined Flatiron. And I, I think I heard this on an earlier panel today, which is one of the powerful tools that registries have is the ability to contact patients or to potentially go back and fill in gaps, right? So, which is different than what we do with data that's sort of generated and we need to make, we need to make what we've got work. But when you have registry information, I, I wonder if part of the skill set is actually identifying what is the most critical data that you need at that moment. And then as you move forward and you have very specific research questions that you might want to ask, being able to identify the patients that might be the most relevant for that question and then go back and fill in the gaps of that additional information. Because anybody who's ever been part of developing a registry or has had to you know, be a medical student who has to enter data, there is a fatigue and a data quality that, happen, that starts to drop as the number of data variables increases, right? Um, and so I, I do wonder if now that technology is available and we're able to search things without using Excel and we have these new tools at our, our fingertips, is there an opportunity here to sort of create your, your mainframe of what you need on potentially every eligible patient, but that the ability to go back and fill in gaps that are relevant to individual questions and, and whether there is an ability to sort of set up that system up front um, because I just wonder if, you know, the missingness, like when I think about from the regulatory perspective, what are the two biggest 
concerns that we've heard. Um, one is missingness. Why is it missing? Can you do something about that? And two is, is it accurate, right? And anytime you start abstracting or pulling out hundreds of variables on patients, both of those things become more at risk, at least in, in my experience. So one of the challenges we see are incentivizing, collecting the data, because the people who, people who are putting the data in are really busy clinicians, doctors, people doing a million things. So, you know, what's in it for me? What am I getting out of this? This is 10 years down the road. How is this going to work? But finding better incentives and, and finding ways to reimburse people for using their their time to enter the information because that's the biggest complaint we get uh, we don't we we don't have the money in this grant or we don't have the money in this program to pay for all this data that needs to be entered and to do all these standards that you want us to do now tina is what i hear a lot of I just want to chime in one th more quickly. I think one thing too is that we need to think about what what is our end goal. So is it to get something to market? Is it to help inform clinical trial readiness? What is the end goal? And I think that's what we have to keep in mind when we're starting to determine what is the data we need to collect and how are we going to do that in a standardized way. So I just but, wanted to add that in. But why do those two things need to be separated, like clinical trial readiness? And good data standards and stuff. I, I mean, they, I they don't need to be separated, but I, I don't, they don't have to be separated, but I think it's what, where are you trying to go with the data you're collecting? And for every stakeholder, it can be slightly different. And so for our industry partners, it's going to be to get something to market. And so I think we have to, in the collaborative way, find what we need to develop the standards that will be a broad basing, but there's still maybe unique needs. And so I think we just need to remember what, what is the ultimate goal? And, and Marta's question was, how do we get something regulatory sufficient? I think she used regulatory grade. And so what is really that is, and what do I need for that marketing application? That, that's what I'm hearing from the original question is, what do I need to do to have the data standards needed to have data that, as Teresa has said, all data comes into us to be reviewed? So, so I moved to, so we have uh, just, uh, we're actually, this is a great discussion. We could go on for another half hour. I'm just conscious of time. So I will go to Klaus and then Eileen, and then we'll, I, I think we'll need to start wrapping up. But we have a whole afternoon tomorrow. We can come back to some of these. So Klaus, please. Thank you. Thank you. This will be real quick. Just a uh, comment on our experience with uh, with polycystic kidney disease uh, in which we were able to integrate uh, thousands of patients worth uh, of, of data uh, in from three registries, three academic registries, Mayo, um, uh, um, Colorado, and Emory. And in the process of standardizing the data, we, we used and we partnered with uh, our, our CETAS colleagues uh, to, to develop those standards. And we use those standards to remap the data so that we can build the database and then from the database generate a series of actionable solutions that uh, have, have essentially transformed the pipeline for drug development in, in, in PKD. One of the outcomes, one of the collateral outcomes of that effort is that the, the academic colleagues that were amazing at contributing the data from those three registries got exposed to this whole world that was totally new to them of, of CETA standards and why uh, it, those eventually became a mandate for, for data submissions to the FDA. That, that really, quote unquote, opened their eyes. And we now, those registries, have that added value of uh, from the standpoint of after the, the, the data were integrated, after that, they, they embraced a lot, of the, a, a lot of the standardization that was done retrospectively for their uh, future data collection. So that I call that a, a major victory. Can we replicate that one disease at a time versus just having a, a more of a more of a holistic approach to to embracing data standards across diseases? That's a question of efficiency, but I think there's there are examples of, of success on that front. Thanks, Klaus. And so I uh, Eileen? Yes, so, so going back to the comment of EHR data and, and standards, so, so again, I want to state that we need to think about how we can, we can make it such that there is, there is less mapping from the EHRs. Again, they're not consistent, so that's a problem. 
to what data FDA will accept um, and that they can, it will help them to evaluate the efficacy and safety of a drug. And I, and I certainly appreciate CDIS standards and I, and I certainly understand wh why they were developed when they started to be developed. But again, try, because once you start mapping, you lose a little bit of information. You also have the possibility things aren't mapped exactly correctly. So the more that we can go back to the source, which a lot of times is the, the EHR, the EMR, the better, the better quality data I think that we're going to end up with. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Eileen. And uh, it's, it's time for us to start wrapping up. As I uh, just said a moment ago, um, you know, I, it, it's, uh, I'm really glad that we have day two because we'll have more of an opportunity to dive into it. We're going to have a slight switch. Um, so actually, Mark McClellan is going to be moderating. But uh, one thing that I will pass on to him is it's one thing to get this group to, to be talking about what the issues are. It's a whole different um, thing to ask this um, group to start uh, coming up with solutions because the group got uh, particularly energized when I started asking questions about, OK, so what can we do differently um, and, and, and better? So um, you know, thank you again uh, for your participation, for your engagement. Uh, we are going to uh, resume tomorrow um, at, um, at 1 p.m. Uh, again and continue on with um, uh, several more um, sessions. And uh, so uh, with that, I, I wanted to um, say thank you and we will see you tomorrow.